Welcome everyone to the Town of Scarborough, uh, September 3rd, 2019 meeting of the uh, Planning Board. If you could all join me with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Dorian, could you please call the roll? Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Henriksen. Here. Roger Bealey. Here. Robin Saunders. Rick Duperry. Jennifer Ladd. And Rick Meinking. Here. Thank you. Uh, we do have minutes for the uh, August 12th, 2019 meeting. We've all had a chance to review them. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. A little housekeeping, uh, just to, um, for the record, uh, Rick Meinking will be a voting member this evening. Thank you. And we're going to jump right into it. Uh, number five, Jay Chatmus requests a preliminary subdivision review for 34 New Road, Assessor's Map R35, Lot 17. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as you may recall, this is located in the RF and Aquifer Protection overlay districts and the applicant was last before you all in July uh, for the review of this proposed six lot conservation subdivision and at that meeting the board requested several edits to the plan relating to lot design uh, the stream buffer and roadway design so the applicant did modify the road uh, design and is now proposing a 22 foot wide public uh, paved street as requested by the public works department and as you may recall again, there, are, there were concerns raised about the applicant providing a 75 foot buffer adjacent to the entire portion of the tributary on the property. And it does look like the applicant uh, did modify the property line of lot six uh, to address these, these concerns, but did not modify the property line of lot one. Um, so staff uh, continues to recommend that the applicant pull back this property line so the entire lot is outside of the buffer. Staff also raised concerns about the proposed stormwater facilities uh, being placed on a private residential property um, as it appears under drain soil filter number two is located within lot one. So staff has recommended that this property line be adjusted again to exclude the stormwater feature to provide a clear separation uh, from ownership and future maintenance. And staff has recommended uh, that the applicant provide a plan note on the final plan that requires all future development of the remaining land on the property to be accessed by the future right of way that the applicant's proposing. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, with that said, we, if you'd please introduce yourself to the project. We'd really like to hear about the main points of uh, staff's comments and any updates that have happened to this plan so far. Thank sure. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Um, here this evening with the uh, pleasure of representing uh, Carmen and Jay Chapmas regarding this particular project. As uh, Jamel has already mentioned, we won't uh, uh, rehash all the information, but I'm happy to address the information that is before you. Jamel touched on some of the higher points. I will certainly go through those. I'm actually going to add a couple to that, and then I'll entertain any questions or comments that you may have. The purpose of us being here this evening is a uh, request to receive up to the board, of course, uh, preliminary approval, and then we will be back shortly for final approval. We'll go from there. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I'd like to be able to say that uh, we do have the DEP permit. Last time we were here, it was pending, uh, still outstanding, and we have subsequently received that, and it's all set. Uh, the biggest issue that was on the table last time, as far as the board was concerned, was the request to be able to expand the uh, roadway coming in from New Road from 20 feet to 22 feet. Uh, that has been created. We have done that. We also mentioned that to the DEP in conjunction with the permit and we are so far under the threshold for the tier one uh, that uh, that was not an issue with the DEP. Um, so we're about uh, uh, two thirds of the way under that threshold or two thirds at that threshold. So there's no permit or there's no problem. And, and again, the staff does have the permit. So as far as the main elements are, that uh, staff has identified for consideration, uh, lot one, uh, sorry about that. I know we talked about the, the buffers and we were focusing on lot six, which is the last lot on the left. Uh, we didn't even think about lot one. It's not an issue. It's very, very minor as far as that 75 feet is concerned. And uh, we'll certainly have that on there. It's only a few feet basically into the lot. So we'll certainly have that on there as far as the final plan is concerned. So there's no issues with showing that 75 foot buffer. Um, the pond being on lot one, 
we've done a, a real estate study and while economics alone does not enter into an equation for anything that's approved by the uh, planning board, it certainly does enter into it in terms of the value of the project and the return on the investment. Toward that end, we've been told uh, quite a number of times that a, in, this, in Scarborough, basically in this particular area, uh, one acre or more lot would be very desirable toward that end, uh, toward the marketing of those properties. Toward that end, um, as far as the uh, portion of the stormwater maintenance device being on lot one, uh, there is a portion of it on there, but it's completely controlled by the easement. So if there's any issues in terms of any problems with maintaining that pond, that easement is actually going to go to and be a part of the homeowners association responsibilities, uh, and they will end up taking care of that. That easement covers the, any liability for that particular homeowner without issue. Um, so given that it's the end result is basically exactly the same, whether there's an easement or on the property or completely off the property, it really doesn't make any difference toward the maintenance of that facility. So we would like to be able to keep that on there. The point being is that if we took it away, that lot would decrease, not hugely, but substantially less than one acre. And toward that end, we would like to be able to keep it at one acre. Uh, and again, the end result would not be any different. Uh, as far as the um, uh, adding the note for future access, that's absolutely fine uh, as far as restriction for future access to the uh, to the overall lot. That's what Jamel and Jay and the rest of us had agreed to or, or discussed and agreed to months ago. So we'll certainly add that note to the plan. The one exception to that would be the uh, where the um, driveway and the roadway, the paper street roadway that you see on the bottom of your plan is located. That would ostensibly serve one lot and one lot only. That would be uh, just to the... Um, up the side of the, just the north of the, uh, the small pond, the first pond that you see on site. There's a, a beautiful little building envelope that back in there, it's actually not so little, uh, that follows the existing driveway in that uh, roadway down off of New Road. Uh, that would actually be restricted. In other words, that quote unquote driveway could not extend as it does now between the ponds. This is for future development. So that any future development of the back area, which is almost all upland, uh, would actually come off of uh, the, ex the existing road or what would be the existing road at that time. And um, we'd be happy to put that note on there, but I just wanted to bring up the, the attention of the board that, that there is one more lot, literally a long new lot, a new road uh, down at the bottom of your screen where you see that. Uh, we've talked about the waiver request. I won't go into that in detail. Uh, staff is comfortable with the road being uh, 22 feet, which it is. Uh, also uh, proposing the uh, uh, in-lieu fee for the sidewalks. Um, we don't, uh, Jamel has mentioned that uh, the applicant appears comfortable with this approach. We do. Uh, we would like to work with staff toward the uh, amounts due regarding the linear footage. Uh, we can certainly do that uh, with the staff. That's not an issue as far as the planning board is concerned or as far as we're concerned with the planning board. Uh, we do agree in principle to be sure to that in-lieu fee that we discussed last time. The aquifer protection overlay. I'm just going down the notes as you probably see them in your packets. Uh, we will certainly state that, state that on there. Uh, that's not an issue. The overlay or uh, the aquifer protection overlay district basically deals with uh, commercial properties or any properties that might otherwise create hazardous waste or some type of toxic materials uh, generating that at site that would end up leaching through the soils. This is just a simple residential subdivision. There's no issue toward that end, but we'll certainly refer to that uh, as far as the notes on the plan are concerned. So there's no problem toward that. Roadway design. Uh, public Works is recommending a steel guardrail. We certainly understand the pension of, of Public Works to be able to recommend something to that effect, but uh, in this particular case, we would uh, say that a guardrail, uh, the wooden guardrail that we show is absolutely fine, uh, especially now that the roadway has been yet widened even further. Um, a steel guardrail is more for uh, high volume, high speed traffic that is uh, coming close to an area where if there was an accident, there actually could be a significant rollover or down a fairly steep embankment. Please keep in mind that the narrowness of the embankments on this particular section running in from New Road, uh, the steepest area they've got there is about three feet. That's it. Um, and with the widened pavement and the, uh, the, guard, the wooden guardrail uh, at a speed that would be basically 15 miles an hour on a dead end private road or a dead end street, um, would be uh, absolutely adequate toward that end. So all due respect to Department of Public Works, we think that the wooden guardrail is absolutely fine toward that end. By the way, for those of you who are uh, with us uh, when last year when we did the um, Carrier Woods Apartments just on Muzzy Road, 
uh, Muzzy Road is a considerably higher traffic and, and uh, higher speed road, and that also has a wooden guardrail uh, adjacent to the road. So I don't think that there's going to be any problems toward that end. It's a common use, uh, wooden guardrails, and we just like to be able to keep it that way. Uh, as far as the road profile is concerned, showing the 15-inch culverts uh, further embedded to show six inches on the bottom, that's absolutely fine. Doesn't change anything as far as the volume is concerned. We can certainly do that. That was one of the uh, reviewing engineer's comments. By the way, Jamel has been very effective at taking the engineer's comments and putting them into your packet specifically and kind of rewording them to make it, uh, take it out of engineer speak. Um, so toward that end, we, uh, we compliment him on that one. And this is very easy to do in this regard. Um, also talking about a cross-section, an additional cross-section uh, in the location of those 15-inch uh, uh, culverts. Uh, we do have uh, three of those already. We can certainly add the fourth one that's up the hill a little bit, but that's absolutely no problem. So we can take care of that as well. Uh, pavement transition detail, again, not an issue. It's a simple detail. We can certainly show that. Basically what that means is that we're looking to make sure that the pavement is um, for lack of a better term, tilted to the point where water is going to flow downhill to the uh, catch basin that is then, or will have the, uh, bit, uh, the uh, um, bituminous on the top of that, the pavement details. So that's not an issue either. Uh, slip form curb details. Talking about uh, showing the mold to be used for the concrete curb, that detail is actually on the plan. That's the DOT requirement for slip form, and that's already in your plan seat, uh, and, uh, seat sheet and the miscellaneous detail sheets. Um, so that's no issue. And then uh, slip form curbing is not embedded. Slip form doesn't get embedded. Um, slip form curbing essentially is set into the side of the road and then the road uh, pavement is actually built up on top of that or, or up the side of that. So it's not like we're, many of us may be used to seeing uh, vertical granite details where what you see of the vertical granite above grade has got about is only about a third of what's actually there. The other two thirds, probably half the two thirds, is actually below grade. Um, for slip form details, uh, that it doesn't work that way. There is no portion of concrete that's actually below that surface level. Um, there is a small portion of it that's set and then the pavement is actually put up the curb, uh, the side of it, so that anybody who hits that or whatever still has an anchoring on there. Um, but it doesn't actually go, okay? I will defer to Angela uh, as far as the, uh, she's shaking your head over there. And, I, I'm sorry. I just think we're getting into the weeds, and we do actually have a detail showing it. Scarborough has a specific detail, which I could share with you. I don't think we need to Piece go of cake. the details. No issues. <laughs> um, and then the, the last detail, on this, or the last comment on this sheet was about the, um, uh, the street trees, adding some street trees. We've got quite a number of street trees along the frontages of all the lots. Uh, the comment is about adding street trees to the roadway from New Road to the Angle. This is an area that we're trying to absolutely minimize the impact to as far as cutting. And, and remember, for those of us that were on the site walk, albeit quite a while ago, or for anybody who cares to drive by, that's a very heavily wooded area. And we are restricted by the DEP permit as well to only disturbing the area that we're proposing for the width of the right-of-way. So toward that end, there's really no room to plant any trees, and I'm not really sure in that particular area. And I'm not sure that they would do any good because there's going to be plenty of vegetation, including from fairly good-sized trees that are already there. Um, if the board determines that that's an absolute requirement, we can, a tree's a tree, we can certainly put it in there, but I think we've got an overabundance of trees already in that particular area. Mm -hmm. Just not sure the necessity to add more in that particular section. Stormwater management. Um, talking about adding the, uh, we reevaluated the stormwater management plan and um, uh, the BMPs, the, the designers uh, uh, indicated that the increase in the two-year storm event shown on the BMPs, not a problem. We'll show that on the plan as well. Uh, very easy to do that. And then uh, we're just referring to the uh, engineer's comments that, again, Jamel has melded already into these comments that we've just discussed. Uh, as far as open space is concerned, uh, there's absolutely no issue um, in terms of uh, um, the underdrain uh, that's located within that open space. We can certainly take that out of that calculation. We were considerably over on the amount of open space that we were actually offering than is what is required. So doing that is absolutely no issue. So we'll take care of that, and we still have plenty of open space that exceeds the minimum requirement for that. Uh, Homeowners Association, you, the staff will have a copy of that uh, coming up for, with final approval. And then uh, final subdivision stamped by professional engineers, surveyor, et cetera. We don't have any issues with that, but I would like to point out something that uh, to the staff that you might want to consider for a future. Um, we try, when we submit plans to anyone, whether it's in Scarborough or anywhere else, uh, we've had 
issues in the past, meaning over the course of the last 30 years or so, where stamped the wrong stamped plans get out to the public, which means that if we stamp a series of plans for review by the planning board or zoning board or any other board for that matter, um, and the, the board has comments, which you often do, that you would like to be seen on those plans, we don't want to have too many professionally stamped plans that are out there that are not the final copies. We're happy to do that if the board, if that's the pension of the board, to, to make that sure that that's happened, but it obviously will happen when we submit to the Mylar to you. I'm presuming there will be certain, the certain standard conditions when we get to final that you'll want to see toward that end. Um, we're happy to give you stamped plans, but again, we just want to make sure that those are minimized because we don't want to get the wrong plans out there. That's just a generic comment for the future, the, but there's no issue toward that end. And uh, that's pretty much it. Given that, we're happy to uh, answer any questions or address any comments that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this topic, please approach the podium, state your name, and let us know what your thoughts are. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comments. Um, so I think for our purposes here tonight, I really kind of want to drill down on the uh, stormwater, uh, the underdrained soil filter that's below lot one. It's, it seems to me like this is probably a bit of a sticking point between the proposal and um, staff requirements. So I think the board should weigh in on whether or not that should be on private property, should it be moved, and I'll, I'll kick it off with a question. The, the location of that filter, it, can it be moved somewhere else on the property, or is it necessary to be in that location because of the way stormwater is all designed meant to flow to that spot. Exactly. It's the latter. Okay. Um, when we enter into the project, any project for that matter, we look for obviously the best point, which is typically the lowest point. In this particular case, um, the, there are two ponds in this particular situation, and that one is specifically designed to take that stormwater from that side. So there's really no other place to put it. Um, could we change the lines? Sure. Um, but again, keep in mind, if this were not a conservation subdivision and a regular subdivision, uh, any stormwater management devices would be on private property with easements anyway. So in this particular case, it, our argument is that it doesn't really matter as long as the language of the easement will cover the same information and liabilities and um, specific uh, responsibilities for maintaining that device, whether it's in the common area that is maintained by the Homeowners Association or in a small portion, which most of it is, but a portion of it on one lot that is also maintained by the Homeowners Association, there's really no difference. So we'd just like to be able to keep it there again from the marketability standpoint. Okay. So I'd like board members to just quickly weigh in on your thoughts on that one, being one of the major remaining main elements of staff identified points. Rachel, you want to start off? Yeah, um, actually, I don't have, I, I, I'm persuaded by your argument about the, uh, the it really doesn't make a, a difference as long as there is an easement there. Um, but let me say that what we've talked about in the past, not just with the stormwater, um, but um, in general is the no disturbed area. And that would be a no disturbed area. And what I would be comfortable with is some sort of marking, either boulders or fence, on that lot indicating it is a no disturb area in addition to um, the notice, uh, some sort of notation on the uh, contract, on the homeowner's deed. And that that would be of a little more comfort to me, I think, if we do that. And then I see no problem keeping the lot as is. Thank you, Rachel. Roger? Um, I basically agree with Rachel on that, uh, but I am intrigued with your, um, your argument that the market value is enhanced if it's an acre versus cutting it back. Because to me, if I was considering purchasing that piece of property with that stormwater facility right there, I would, I would be, I mean, obviously you can't use it, as a, as a homeowner. So I, to me, if you're talking about a, a pure acre plus where it's totally usable uh, versus what you have here, I, I, I just, I'm not sure I, I buy that argument, but at the same time, I could understand what Rachel's saying, so. Thank you, Roger. Rick? Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I think having the protected area uh, marked 
is is a good solution to this. Okay. And is the applicant okay? No, no problem. All right. It's easy to do. So now I'll open it up to the board for anyone else that wants to jump in with other questions or comments for the applicant. Roger. Sure. Um, regarding the uh, rail, the steel metal rail versus the um, wood, um, I would tend to agree with you on that because to me, a metal fencing is something you see on a major road. And I think the, the wooden fence would just enhance the, the appearance of the whole neighborhood much better. So uh, that's my thoughts on that. Um, and I, I don't have any problems with most. I'm assuming all these other things that uh, he talked about during his presentation can be handled at the staff, staff level, the majority of those things. Uh, well, yeah, leading up to the final submission. Yeah. So there's one more review from you guys. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you, Roger. Rachel? Yeah, I just want to confirm that, that you're talking about there being at some point a lot along New Road next to the Francis Aubrey and Lolette Nurse uh, Aubrey property. Yes. Is that, is that, so... Um, I would assume that at some point then you're going to come before us, the Jetmas will be coming before us to, for a subdivision there. I, it may not be, Mr. You may never see this again, but if we do, then uh, yes, we will be showing that at the time. Um, have you, in any of the contemplation of that, um, has there any been, been any thought as to how the, such a thing would impact the, the ponds there? Such uh, a division? Yes, it actually wouldn't any more than what's already here. If that doesn't work on that, if I may call your attention to the uh, um, depiction behind you, this is the area that we're talking about right in here for a potential house lot, and this is the street that would lead to it. Right now, the driveway comes all the way back up here to the mm -hmm. house that's right up in this area. So what would happen is at the end of the paper street that curves up into this area, and the de develop future development would be around here. The lot that's right down here would actually be cut off right in this section, and we've got a nice building envelope that's right in this particular area um, that can be 75 feet away from any of the ponds and still be exceptionally viable. So it's a nice little lot toward that end that is actually served by this little paper street road down here, which is allowed for Scarborough standards. So this lot right here would ostensibly in the future at some point, or we would reserve the right to, for instance, um, if Mr. Chapman's does do the uh, I'm sure Mrs. Chapman's do the development, or if they sell it to somebody else who decides to do the development. Well, let's put it this way. At some point in the future, they're going to divest themselves of the property, and it very likely will be developed, as most of Scarborough probably will be eventually. So toward that end, we'd just like to be able to reserve that right to have that single lot down in that particular area, and then everything else in the notes on the plan would reflect that everything else would end up uh, being restricted to uh, coming off of the end of the proposed road. All right, so there would be some sort of a note that says that Paper Street ends at a certain it ends reasonable you see point. It now, and yes, we would end up actually, we can put a note on the plan toward that end. Yeah, so that uh, it's clear that it's not going to connect the back way through that development. That's correct. And good. Um, I have a question. You said that the police uh, were still considering the street name. Do you have a new street name? Uh, yes, it's uh, Wood Duck Road. And uh, we submitted that, and they are still running through the list, as it were. We haven't heard back from them toward that end. All right. And if they do, we'll change it, but hopefully that will be fine. All right. And one final thing. Uh, you indicate you have no intention of doing a trail system. Uh, I know that had been under discussion. Could you tell me why you're not going to have that trail system since we don't have a sidewalk? Um, sure. Uh, we were proposing at the time that we'd love to do a trail system in lieu of the sidewalk and the in lieu fee and uh, thing that would actually open up, uh, assuming that people of the sidewalks would ostensibly be for people you know, walking back and forth, just jogging, walking, skiing, whatever it might be. Um, and toward that end, we're discussing a pathway across the back of, of lots two through six. Um, in this particular case, um, given the expenses involved, if we're doing it, the in lieu fee for the sidewalk, uh, which is fine, then uh, we would propose not to do that trail system. Now, keep in mind that that's still open space. So toward that end, if the Homeowners Association decides that they're gonna end up walking through those woods or doing a trail on their own, that's absolutely fine. Homeowners Association open space, so they can certainly do that. Um, but with the in lieu fee as well, uh, which is quite expensive, uh, we didn't wanna to go to that additional expense of putting that trail in there. Now, if we want to reduce or get rid of the in lieu fee, we'd be absolutely happy to put that trail there. 
Well, I, I know there are other developers who do both a sidewalk and a trail system, and uh, I'm uh, just kind of concerned that uh, all of a sudden in an amenity and um, a place for a public gathering uh, is disappearing. Rachel, I understand absolutely, and mm -hmm. I would be so forthright as to say if this were a 10 lot or greater subdivision, there would be absolutely no issue toward that end. As a six lot subdivision with the length of the road that we've got and the expense that's gone into creating this, any additional expenses are getting very, very tight. Again, I know that economics doesn't mm -hmm. enter into the argument, but it actually does to a certain degree. And toward that end, if we are going to be responsible for an in-lieu fee, which is quite expensive, an additional expense of putting in that uh, um, the tra any proposed trail would be, if not over the top, rapidly approaching that point. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. For any few extra, of course costs. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, and toward that end, literally. that's that's the rule for the planning board. Just so you know. Oh yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I understand expense. I still would urge you to take a look at some sort of a a gathering place availability in there for for people to get together since they don't have the sidewalk they don't have a trail where are they going to meet um, there's no sense of community here uh, with the trail there was an opportunity to put a couple of benches along there create a place for people to sit and talk and now we have an isolated six isolated building spots and that's really not not a community Thank you. Point taken. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Rick? Um, regarding the, the uh, fence, is it maybe because Public Works is worried about snowplow damage if they were to take care of this road, and that's um, why they're advocating for steel versus wood? And I think he wants to respond. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't speak specifically for public works, but I think it's probably more that uh, as any public works uh, director or people um, would typically espouse given doing what they do, uh, they would probably say, as Roger had indicated, you know, a steel guardrail is going to stop a semi and anything else that's cruising down a road toward that end. This particular, so toward that end, we understand what, why they would say that, but we again try to put this in perspective where this is a dead-end road with only six lots on it and everybody's going down there is probably going to live there. The road is now wider. The, uh, the wooden guardrail still meets DOT standards. So toward that end, I don't think we have any issues. Uh, I I hope, go ahead. I guess I can speak to um, having a conversation with Mike Shaw, the Public Works Director. And um, I think what they're finding is that the wooden guardrails, they are damaging them through the snow plows. And I understand that you made it wider. Um, but it was wider from a narrower road. So what they're looking at is they would be pushing back from the shoulder and then it drops into the wetlands on either side. So um, their concern is they'll be replacing that with a steel guardrail over a short amount of time. And so I think you might see additional comments during final review from Public Works on that if they want to. Um, yeah, that would be kind of helpful because <laughs> I don't want to you know, right. handcuff them and at the right. same time, I agree with Roger that aesthetically, for a little mm -hmm. little uh, mm -hmm. lot area, it would be nice to put the wood in. Um, so I'll wait for the final on that. Um, just one other thing on uh, streetlights. I didn't see anything. Is there any plans for streetlights? No. Would we, we tried to. Um minimize what's kind of euphemistically referred to as light pollution. Um, yeah. In this particular area, it's very rural. Uh, there are lights, and I know we discussed this a little bit last time, but uh, there are ambient lights on each one of the houses. Um, so as far as a street light at the end in this particular area, the other subdivisions that are out there, most of them we took a look at, especially the one right across the street doesn't have that. And we just don't think it's necessary in this type of rural environment. Now, having said that, I would get one more comment. If and when this road does get extended, that's a bit of a different story uh, because now we would have uh, eight to 10 additional lots in the upland area at the end of the road, bringing the overall total to anywhere from you know, 14 to 16, 17, 18 lots, whatever might be able to go in there. 
now we've got sort of that economy of scale that says if we're going to have that many lots, we probably should have one lot at the end anyway, uh, or perhaps even two. <coughs> at this particular juncture, I just don't think that, that light is necessary. And given that we've got subgrade power um, with uh, uh, transformers there, it's very easy to be able to extend anything uh, if and when the remaining property ever does get. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's easy to run a couple of lights. And given the fact that you're not, we're, we're, you know, the sidewalk's not going to be there, now you do quite potentially. And I think uh, you brought that up last meeting about maybe kids going to school and in the wintertime it's dark uh, to catch the bus. Um, maybe go back to the owner and talk about maybe one or two lights just to cast a little bit. With the, you know, the cutoff fixtures, you're not going to do a whole lot of light pollution. Um, and it might bode well for um, my vote for wood versus steel guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Choose your poison, I guess. Yes, right. <laughs> That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I have a quick question on um, going back to the shared driveway well, or the paper road. Is there any reason it remains a paper road versus like a private drive or a shared driveway type of access? Is there... If it's only serving one lot, mm -hmm. it only needs to be the paper street. If it serves more than one lot, then it meaning this one or anyone, then it would have to be uh, built out better, more specifically. Otherwise, it just supports a driveway. That's a Scarborough standard. Okay. So, so it would service just the two lots then? It won't. It only service one lot. So that's not his driveway to the house in the back? Yes, but that's the only driveway right now that goes to that back lot. So but when you add <clears> the second <throat> lot on that? Well, no, because um, if the... Uh, if the back lot, if and when the back lot does get developed, then the only area, including where the existing driveway now ends at the house, uh, the homestead that's on that property, that will all be part of the access from our road. Uh, it will not be, there will be no extension of the I existing driveway. I see what you driveway. mean. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then for the wood versus steel, I, I think I just kind of want to clarify with public works that are, you know, next submission, maybe some more detail around that. Um, aesthetically, can see the point of wanting wood uh, versus steel in a small neighborhood like this, but I got to believe they have the reasons, and I'd like to see them. So we'll we'll sure. see what that looks like. Um, they'll take notes and get some more information for us. Um, yes. Um, regarding the uh, street lights, do we know whether there's any kind of a street light or anything at McIntyre Way right now? And when. Like I know where I live, every place there's a new, there's a street, there's a street light. Not necessarily all up and down the street, but wherever there's an intersection of any type, there's a street light. Now, who's responsible for that? Is it the town or is it on the developer? For the maintenance or for the no, install? No, the installation. So typically during this subdivision review, we, we talk about that, where we look at intersections and curves in the road, yeah. um, like we were talking about in Bailey's last well, time. That's, that's what I was thinking about, Bailey's. Yep. You know. yep. Um, and then it becomes installed by the developer, and then when we accept the street, it becomes the town's to, um, to maintain, maintain and operate. Yeah. Yep. So do we have any idea about McIntyre? <laughs> are you checking there? We can... The we can Checking their electrical bill or something. <laughs> we we just on another project, we have a um, a dead end road similar to this one, and we're um, at the curve. They're putting a, a light at the at the oh there is a street light there okay. So it's the huh? intersection. Yeah, at the intersection. Now at. yeah, in this place, uh, McIntyre is not not directly right across the street. Anyways, um, we, we've uh, asked them on this other project to put a, a light right at the curve. Um, so that's something to think about. And, and I understand, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's actually our project as well. And, oh, it uh, is? That, okay, that's so. a perfect example of what I was talking to Rachel about earlier. There's 11 lots in that subdivision, and this has got six. And okay. there's no magic triggered number of lots, et cetera, but that was enough lots, in our opinion, to say, 
we're not going to go here. I mean, as far as trying to avoid that, it just doesn't make any sense yeah. because there are plenty of there are more people there, more lots than are in this particular one. Um, it's not that we want to avoid street lights. It's just in this particular case, we don't think it's necessary because of the number of lots on the on the street. So I'm going to jump in and ask um, maybe staff's opinion on whether a note. Would a note be an appropriate instance of saying if this ever expands past the six units or six lots, that a light would be installed at that intersection and you know at the, at the end of the current dead end? Is that possible to say if it ever ends up with an extension of more lots being added that those are those must be included in future? I mean, how does that work? Well, I would think they'd have to come back in to do another approval through the board, right? Um, so I guess at that point. It would be the willingness of the planning board to say whether or not they wanted to run infrastructure through an existing street, um, where it's obviously more co costly to do it then. Um, and at this point, like you're saying, with no sidewalks and, um, I mean, the point about like uh, no sidewalks, walking to school, and things like that in the dark. I think you make a case that you're gonna have that long stretch with no houses. I think it makes sense, like you were saying about the end of the street. Um, I'm not a proponent of street lights because um, it's just cost to the town. But in some instances, like you're saying, you have the ambient lights from the houses, but you have that first stretch where you have a straight shot in and a curve. It would appear that the curve might be the place you want to look at, just so you see that that bend in the road, especially if it's already lit at the intersection, which you'd have to check that. Because th we get a lot of complaints if um, people are trying to find a, a road and there's not a light, it's very difficult, especially on a country road like, like New Road. All right, so I think we as a board owe the applicant some direction on street lighting at this juncture. I would say um, I, I don't see a need for trees along that straight stretch, but I would, I think they should, you should consider the street lights. We can certainly take a look at that at the curve. Okay. Um, if the, the Cobra light is at the, uh, at the intersection, there's going to be, and that's not ambient light, that's direct light. Um, that's going to be lighting, well, you know what street lights look like they're, when they're on, they're pretty bright. Um, and toward that end, I think the, uh, while not bathed in light, I think there's going to be quite a number of, or quite an amount of light from new road to the ang to the turn, uh, to the angle in the road. Um, and then as we get up into the house areas, it's simply our contention that there's going to be enough lights <coughs> on the houses themselves to be able to provide any an indirect or ambient light for some, from a safety perspective in those hours in the wintertime when kids do go to school when it's dark or they get, people come home, they drive home when it's dark, et cetera. Um, just think there's enough lighting out there. We're not going to make that a bone of contention. Um, it just we want to try to be able to keep lights down to a minimum and still be safe. In this particular case, we think the safety is there, uh, given the six lots. But toward that end, it's up to the board. Well, uh, I agree re regarding the uh, lights from the residential uh, buildings. You know, I, I I don't think you need street lights there, but I think you should consider the two that we talked about. Uh, the one at the curve you're talking about? The one at the curve and then potentially one at the end of the street. At the very end of the street? No, as you go in. Oh, in, off in a new, new road. Off a new road. In the intersection? Okay. Um, yeah. didn't, Angela, didn't we just say that there was a Cobra light there? On McIntyre, on the opposite. I don't know where it lines up. I'm looking at Google Earth. I'm sorry. I'm looking at Google Earth right now, and McIntyre does have a Cobra head. I don't know where it is in relationship to your entrance and... We can certainly show that. But it, that is it, an opportunity. Yeah, you might yeah. not need one because of that. So it's yeah. something you'd have to look at how far away it is sure. from your entrance. We can certainly take a look at that and have that information for you next time. Um, again, we're not adverse to it. We just think that that'd be a little overkill given the size of the, of the development. But. So I'll, I'll just throw in that um, I think that curve might be a good opportunity for a light. Um, even if there wasn't one at the intersection, I think that, that curve, you know, that's where people get themselves into trouble is around a blind curve and I you know see them all around town and more lighting there won't hurt you so okay. um, if I had to weigh in on it that's the spot I would actually prefer to see one post in if anything so yeah I uh, you you've sold us on 
so much on the amount of uh, vegetation and trees covering everything there that I think the ambient lighting may not show up at that curve where it's needed for the kids. So I, uh, I yeah, thank you. I, I, I would suggest a light at the curb. Okay, so I think you have some direction. Um, so with, is there any other planning board comments at this point? So now that we've all taken some um, copious notes, I will make a motion uh, for preliminary subdivision approval, uh, pending that you'll continue to work with staff on these improvements. Of course. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Sure, that's okay. be unanimous. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Item number six uh, was tabled this evening. That was Kathleen Bailey uh, requests a final subdivision review for 27 Ross Road. So if you're here for that item, um, it will not be heard this evening. Uh, next item is uh, number seven, AV Technic LLC requests a sketch plan review for the Downs Innovation District Assessor's Map U053, Lot 4. Jamel. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And this is located in the CPD uh, zoning district um, within the uh, recently approved Innovation <laughs> District subdivision, uh, the northern portion of the Scarborough Downs redevelopment project. So the applicant's in for a sketch plan, and staff would just like to point out that the you know, sketch plan is an opportunity for a high-level discussion uh, between the board and the applicant uh, that sort of sets the table for the formal site plan submission in the future. So the applicant's proposing a 24,420-square-foot uh, warehouse and office building located on Lot 28 within the Innovation District um, on the corner of Innovation Way in an unnamed private drive. Um, this lot has been identified as a front lot in the district's regulating plan, and the board should also consider the unique location of the lot uh, within the project as it is adjacent to the Innovation Way and Center Street intersection, um, which will become a corridor into the heart of the Downs uh, project. So one of the key issues, uh, as you went through the notes, um, that staff recommends to the board, um, that the board discuss with the applicant, is access management. So understanding that, that the proposed access will be along the secondary frontage off the, along the private drive as identified in the regulating plan um, that was approved during the master planning process. Uh, staff has recommended that the applicant consider eliminating a curb cut and provide one full access driveway uh, into the site. Staff has also recommended that the applicant narrow down the proposed curb cuts as much as feasible um, as this would reduce the amount of impervious surface and increase pedestrian safety. So the applicant and the board should be sure to discuss these issues tonight. Steph would also like to note that the regulating plan, regulating plan requires a robust streetscape buffer along the Innovation Way frontage. And given the prominence of the project in relation to the Downs project, staff has recommended that the applicant provide a robust planting and landscaping program uh, also within the southwesterly corner along Innovation Way, as this would help to soften the view of the proposed parking area and building as seen from the square or four-way intersection. The applicant's also proposing to provide 18 parking spaces instead of the required 55. Um, so the ordin zoning ordinance does allow the board to reduce the amount of parking on a site where it is determined that the use can be occupied with fewer spaces. So the board should provide uh, direction to the applicant on whether you guys are comfortable with the amount of proposed parking. And finally, the staff has recommended the applicant provide a sidewalk along the entire front edge of the private drive, given that the Innovation District was designed to be pedestrian friendly. Now, this would allow the public and employees along this drive to easily connect to the public space provided at the four-way intersection adjacent to the project. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Dan, would you like to introduce sure. yourself on the project and uh, clearly speak to some of the main big points here and hopefully we'll give you enough guidance as you go forward in this. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon here from m &R Holdings and the Scarborough Downs team. Um, we're really pleased to report overall. There's a lot of interest in the innovation district, so um, we're excited about that level of interest. We presented score builders, um, a user and user across the street at one of your last meetings and are uh, really excited to be introducing the AV Tech Technic site plan this evening. Uh, AV Technic is an audio video kind of event specialist type use. Um, Daniel Willis is here, the president of AV Tech, who's gonna introduce himself and, and talk 
in more detail about what they do and, and why they're excited about this site and how the site uh, and its program works well for them. Um, so we think this is a, a great user uh, and a great location on this prominent corner at the center of the Innovation District and plan to uh, come back to you at site plan um, with some land, uh, uh, some architecturals uh, that illustrate and, and show how this building fits into the corner. Um, as Jamel indicated, there is um, interest in, in making sure it's attractive on this corner um, and represents the corner well. As the board likely remembers from your subdivision review process, uh, the development is actually providing enhanced landscaping on all four corners of, of um, this four-way intersection. So that landscaping will do a lot of kind of the robust landscaping treatment that, that staff commented on. Uh, a landscaping plan will be generated at your site plan submission to correspond with that, to kind of complement that. Um, so that'll be coming back to you um, with a more formal submission. Um, before I turn it over to Daniel, I did want to kind of comment on the importance of um, the shared driveways um, to this end user. Um, as the board likely remembers through the subdivision process, Innovation Way is the primary public street that provides access um, to all the lots within the Innovation District. And then there's these shared driveways that um, aren't streets. They're, um, they're essentially easements that go across, um, could be up to six lots, um, but in many cases it'll be less. And these shared driveways uh, were intentionally proposed as private so that the lot owners have a bit more flexibility in terms of access, the number of curb cuts, and, and how these driveways integrate with kind of circulation and truck traffic um, in their parking lots. So uh, we believe um, this design is kind of balancing those competing interests, and it's, it's a pretty important design consideration, I know, for AV Technics to have um, some access controls, but also um, some flexibility around the number of curb cuts to, to provide for access for visitors, employees that go to the front of the building, and then provide for truck circulation and backing towards the rear of the site I know that's going to be true for other end users that come along um, and are using these shared driveways. So just wanted to remind the board of that kind of design consideration and how this, these are uh, a good bit different than a public street where access management's uh, critical. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel to, to talk about his business um, and operations and how that's informed this site plan. And then Nancy is going to get into more details around the specifics of the, the site plan and then open up for questions by the board. Thank you. Thanks for uh, your help to date on all this and uh, working through us. It's a, uh, it's a pretty cool project. We're excited to be a part of it. Um, I thought I'd speak uh, sort of informally uh, about uh, about AV Technic, about what we do, and, and sort of how we've gotten here to date, in hopes to uh, help you understand our business and, and, and why this is important to us. Um, my name is Daniel Willis. Um, I started AV Technic in uh, 2004 after spending um, uh, many years on the road uh, working for Sony Records uh, as a touring rock and roll sound engineer and tour manager. So, lived an exciting life for a while. I was originally born here in Portland. I actually bought my first home in Scarborough and lived here for many years. Um, and also uh, had my business located in the industrial park in what's now the Welch Signage Building in the industrial park uh, for some time um, before I bought a building in South Portland on Darling Avenue. Um, I started AV Technic as a one-person operation uh, because I wanted to come back to Maine and uh, continue to do the work that I do, which is providing uh, technical services for uh, events of all kinds. Um, at that time, I started mostly as an audio company, um, and we have since expanded into providing sound, uh, lighting, uh, rigging, uh, drapery, video production services, uh, you name it, for any type of event from a, uh, a two-person uh, web conference to a 20,000-person uh, rock concert. 
Uh, we are not associated with the Rock Row uh, project, so <laughs> I know there's lots of issues there. <laughs> so no relationship. Uh, that being said, um, uh, I started the business because, um, uh, A, it's something that I've always done, something that I've been very passionate about. Um, and uh, when I moved back to Maine, I wanted to uh, start a reality for me that uh, could provide for a family and um, a way that I could give back to the community, be involved in the community. It's a very personal business in that um, uh, we work very closely with clients as an extension, really, of their team to help them communicate uh, on many levels, whether it be artistry or trying to communicate to a team that could be uh, uh, continents away. Um, and so uh, part of that was uh, um, very much about doing something differently, doing something better, doing something that meant, meant something to, to me. Um, and around 2009, um, uh, I hired my first set of employees, um, in which we moved over to the uh, Welch Building in Scarborough, um, and continued then to expand that, uh, that relationship to folks that uh, wanted to be part of this, uh, this business that helps provide people a way to communicate effectively, um, and to also, um, again, be part of something bigger. I guess. Um, we're very close with our clients um, because uh, it's a real extension, it's a real partnership that, that is required to do what we do well. Um, bringing staff on was very personal to me because I wanted to be able to provide them and their families an opportunity to do what they love to do in what's very much a niche market. Um, you know, we're not a company that people drive down the road and say, we need that. You know, it's something very specific. Um, and so um, providing a company that not only are we doing something for uh, uh, companies large and small, I also wanted to create an environment internally where folks that were passionate about this business uh, as much as I was could come, make a living, and do something that means a lot to them. Um, since then, AV Technic has grown. I mean, we're still a very small company in that we only have 10 employees. Um, but we are serving um, a client base from, um, you know, Wex, Hi uh, Idex, Hannaford Brothers, uh, Bath Ironworks, University of New England, Bates, Bowdoin, Colby. Um, we travel mostly around, we travel mostly, we're, we're mostly in Maine, but we travel all over New England and even beyond uh, for certain clients. Um, you know, this past weekend, we're, we just finished up a large music series that we do up at L.L. Bean for their, their summer concert series. Uh, we christened the ships at Bath Ironworks. We're in the middle of convocation orientation season for, um, for uh, many of the colleges mentioned. Um, and, uh, you know, we just helped WEX last week. We work with them weekly uh, to provide a global communication with our streaming services. Um, the building on Darling Avenue has worked out very well, except for we've expanded. It's about 10,000 square feet. Uh, the majority of our business is warehouse. Uh, it does house a lot of this equipment that people hire us to provide. Every service that we provide is custom tailored for the job. There's really no two services that are the same. Um, and again, as I had said from the beginning, this sense of trust, this sense of community, this, extent, this sense of being an extension of these businesses is really what we do. Yes, we provide audiovisual services, but yes, they're relying on us to make sure that we can communicate um, whatever their message may be, whether it be a rock concert or it be a global communication or you name it. One of the, really things, one of the things that attracted me so heavily um, about the Downs was that sense of community. That, that's being created here. Um, I've always believed in being part of something, being part of the community. Um, and my guys coming to work and feeling like they can uh, be proud of where they work, be proud of the folks they work with, and be proud of what and how they do it. And um, the building on Darling Avenue has been wonderful, uh, but it's too small. We've outgrown it. Um, we only have one loading dock. Uh, access is difficult. Parking is uh, is uh, is is limited, mostly from our from a trucking and fleet standpoint. Um, our aisles are three feet wide in our warehouse. 
uh, which is really tight. So um, in our search for finding something um, uh, better, if you will, the Downs Project came about and uh, seemed like the perfect opportunity for us to be part of this community, these, these again, these tree-lined streets. Um, I never thought I'd be starting from scratch like this, but the thought of providing, um, first and foremost, my team of guys who work sometimes 18-hour days, which is a normal show day, three, four days in a row, a place that they can come and be proud of. They come to work and they love it. They feel good, they have the tools they need to work well um, because they work very hard. And so having a place that is uh, internally uh, efficient and effective and allows them to do their job well is a requirement for me as, as their fearless leader, if you will. Uh, it's really important that they can come and feel good about that because if we can't do it right internally, forget about taking care of all of these clients externally. So this Downs project um, is great because it will provide the ability to define a reality for us that is very conducive to what and how we do what we do. Um, the building, um, as you kind of see in this plan, um, is uh, designed in such a way that, again, we, even though we're doing very large scale events, uh, we have a small staff. Um, like I said, currently we have 10 employees, uh, plus me, 11. Uh, there probably is a reality to add a couple more, uh, but we run a pretty tight operation. Again, we keep it to the point where we are providing services on a very personal level. Um, so the idea here is, is that um, from the front of the building, as you see, we are planning very much so to uh, create, uh, which you haven't seen yet, a very attractive, we're planning to put a lot of money into the aesthetics of this building. Uh, again, not because necessarily we have tons and tons of clients coming to our facility, but because I want to make sure when my guys and my team drive in every day, they feel proud about where they are working. And, uh, and so we're going to provide a very attractive front entrance. We're going to wrap the building around the corner as you come in from the side here. Uh, to make sure aesthetically it's, it's attractive, not only for my team, but also for folks driving in the different directions. It was important to me that we kept that separate from the uh, loading area, which is, as you can see, more towards the, uh, the uh, back portion, the northern portion, I guess, if you will, of the, uh, of the lot, um, for a couple reasons. One is because I wanted there to be a separation. I wanted there to be an environment where they could come to a place that looked and felt well, felt really nice, but also we are, uh, we do, we do truck. So, so there has to be that, that loading access. Um, and so the ability to have the, uh, the access and uh, to get in semis, which is not a regular, it's more 26 foot trucks on a regular basis, but being able to get semis to be able to get turned around and backed in safely without congestion of parking, um, without uh, having to navigate uh, tighter, tighter lots was really one of the driving factors in trying to outline um, uh, sort of the flow of the building. Um, we've incorporated a interior loading dock, uh, so the, the, the trucks will actually back into the building fully uh, which is um, sort of, I can't, I don't have my pointer with me, but sort of that center, that center side uh, squared off portion. Um, and the idea behind that is, again, as I said, you know, an 18 hour day is a typical show day for us. So the thought of having to uh, load trucks uh, on a February morning at 2 a.m. Uh, to keep the equipment and the staff uh, safe, we can now back trucks in the night before load what results in millions of dollars of equipment into these trucks and keep them in a safe, secure, climate-controlled uh, uh, situation. And on the reverse side, of course, at the end of a long day, these guys can back their truck into the, the and they can, go, they can go home safely versus having to stay for another hour to unload these, these trucks. So the design of that interior uh, bay is very much uh, in regards to that. It's not completely depicted here, but again, the location of that bay, because it's in sort of, as you see, sort of the middle or the back uh, third or so of the building, is that the warehouse is sort of designed as a U-shape around that loading bay. Because um, of what we do, we have um, 
I'd like to say hundreds of thousands of pieces and parts that make up every single show that we do. And so um, uh, we have to pick pieces and parts for every show independently, and they could be located in many different ways. So the idea between, behind the sort of centralized loading area is, is that we're not having to, we can lay out the, the warehouse in such a way that we can manage the flow of gear and uh, the types that need to go and how it gets packaged and then not having to be pushing things all the way to the back end of the warehouse, you know, the far end. So it gives us a little bit more of a centralized spot to, uh, to, uh, to work to. Um, so, um, so that's sort of, again, con conceptually, that was sort of the, and again, Nancy, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more technically about it, but that's sort of the concept of why um, the plan as it's been outlined um, sort of has come about. Um, and so I thought maybe that would be helpful anyways to try to give you an understanding about who we are and what we do and, and what we're looking for as part of this uh, sketch plan, really. So. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, Daniel and Dan have done a great job of uh, introducing and discussing the project, so I'll be brief in my uh, presentation. I'm Nancy St. Clair with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight to uh, talk to you a little bit more in detail about some of the specifics on the site itself. Uh, as has been mentioned, we're on Lot 28 of the Innovation District, and this 1.63 acre site is located on uh, the northeast corner of the intersection of Innovation Way. And you can see on the little bit on the lower end of that uh, rendering where Center Street intersects um, Innovation Way. Uh, as Dan had mentioned, uh, the access drive that comes up along the westerly side of the site is a private access drive that's shared uh, amongst the lots. And that uh, is the point of access for the uh, two driveways that are proposed as part of this site. As Daniel had mentioned, uh, the, the prominence and the location of the uh, office and employee portion of the site is on the southerly end of the building. That is the um, upgraded facade that is the, uh, that's correct. Um, in that area there uh, is where you won't, you haven't seen it yet, uh, but you will be pleasantly uh, surprised when you do see the building and its elevations uh, for that. If you look closely at the building, uh, roughly in the location of that little white projection on what would be the easterly side of the building, that's actually a patio off a proposed uh, kitchen area within the office space. So that kind of defines sort of the, the delineation point of the office space on the southerly end. And then from the northerly uh, portion of the building, that's all that U-shaped uh, internal uh, warehouse area that Daniel had described. Uh, what does make this building a little bit unique is we do have an interior dock area, and as Daniel mentioned, that's climate controlled and allows the trucks to be uh, loaded and unloaded uh, within the building. The area that's sh sort of shown in white, if you will, on that plan just outside of that dock area is actually a concrete slab that's proposed. The uh, concrete uh, in front of the dock area itself ramps down into that dock location. Uh, in is for truck maneuvering in and out of the building. The remaining area above that on the northerly end is actually uh, for the fleet parking. There are three uh, AV Technic trucks uh, that will park there. That's their, their home uh, in, at night um, once they're emptied out. So uh, that provides for an opportunity for the sort of the truck and the service area on the site. If you look closely behind the building, you'll also see we do have a dumpster. Uh, the dumpster has been placed behind the building to help uh, shield that. We do understand uh, that as part of the site plan review requirements, that will be a screened and fenced in uh, area as well uh, for that. So uh, one of the comments that was made was with regard to sort of the width of the curb cut in that particular location. And as we've described, there are a few things going on in that area that do require that we have sufficient maneuvering uh, areas for the different vehicles that are using that uh, for that. We certainly, uh, in response to staff comments, will take a look to see if we can tighten that up a bit, but we do uh, need to have that for proper maneuvering uh, in circulation in the dock area itself. As Daniel mentioned, one of the other key aspects for the site is provision for a separated entrance uh, to allow his employees to come in 
uh, and out and the occasional visitor to access without coming through the dock area itself. So that is the reasoning behind the entrance that is actually a little bit closer on the southerly side uh, of the site. As Dan mentioned, uh, there is a provision for the 10-foot landscape strip along the frontage uh, of the property on Innovation Way, and we certainly do understand, but as part of a site plan review package, you will be receiving a, a detailed landscape plan that addresses that, uh, as well as uh, other site landscaping features to meet the requirements for site plan review. With the uh, treatment of the building architecturally, we want to make sure that the building is seen, uh, parking is screened, uh, but uh, we want to make sure that there's a healthy balance between that uh, as this is going to be uh, for Daniel a showcase building for him. Uh, so we'd like to obviously make sure that you folks get a chance to see those elevations uh, as part of that. But um, with that, uh, I think the site plan package itself will be uh, enlightening, if you will, uh, for that. So uh, if you recall from going through with the uh, ordinance, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the subdivision review uh, for the innovation district, there were provisions that were made as part of that sort of master plan uh, for the innovation district such that these lots are um, sort of pre-designed, if you will. Uh, there are provisions for utility connections uh, for sewer uh, for this lot. There are also provisions for storm drain connections for this lot as well. The connection point is actually sort of at the midpoint on the southerly end of the site uh, along the innovation wave frontage. That allows a piped connection into the drainage system uh, for the innovation district. Uh, runoff from this site will actually be piped down along innovation way uh, towards the west and be part of the uh, stormwater treatment facilities in pond one, which is under construction right now. Uh, in the Innovation District. So as part of that, there are uh, sort of impervious coverage limits that are established uh, for the lots within the subdivision and provided that you are uh, in accordance with those limits, that you don't exceed them. Uh, there's nothing else to do on the site for stormwater management other than to physically connect uh, the drainage system for the lot into the municipal or uh, master system. And so in this case, we are well below uh, the limitations on that. Uh, we're at 71% impervious uh, on the site right now, and that does include the construction of the access way uh, over the westerly side uh, of the site. So we're well below uh, the threshold, and so we would just, uh, from a stormwater standpoint, be tying in that way. We would be connecting into the service stubs that are provided for uh, the lot. We will be providing you folks with a lighting plan as part of the uh, site plan application package, which will include the photometrics, which was one of the items that was raised uh, as a staff comment. So the other thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly is parking. Uh, we are proposing 18 parking spaces plus an additional three fleet parking spaces for the trucks for AV Technic. And so with that, we are below what uh, mathematically would be uh, calculated for a building of this size for the office component and the warehouse component. That's calculated out at 55 parking spaces. So as part of our package for you, we did provide an exhibit that showed how, if there were a different tenant occupying this building, how that parking might uh, show up. And I don't know, Jamel, if you have it. So that is the uh, exhibit that was prepared for you folks to see how 55 parking spaces might look uh, on that site. Uh, the building's the same. The building has not moved. Uh, in order to achieve that, basically, actually, if, for comparison, what I'll do is I'll leave this up. <coughs> So for comparison, along the frontage, along Innovation Way, the parking orientation is generally the same. Uh, the difference is that there are a few more parking spaces on the southwest corner of the site. Along the westerly side of the building, 
the, if you look on the, the colored rendering here, the large green space that is adjacent to the building would now become parking uh, for that. And then the area that is behind the building that is now for, or beside the rear of the building behind the docks, um, the area that is now for the fleet parking for larger vehicles would be converted to a typical size uh, parking space and the dumpster would be relocated. Uh, in doing that, that changes sort of the circulation pattern in the loading area uh, and in order to achieve that number of parking spaces we would have to eliminate uh, that second curb cut. Now as you heard Daniel speak, the segregation between the employee and the visitor parking and his loading area is very important for his function on his building and his design and vision for this site. Uh, an alternate user, someone who had more of a, a need for that level of parking that would not be something that would be provided as part of that. So uh, that's a comparison plan that we wanted to present to you folks. Mm -hmm. We do know that as part of the process you would have to weigh in on our request to have uh, fewer than the ordinance required parking spaces. So we wanted to get this out and have it uh, as part of our sketch plan discussion with you. Uh, we've talked on a few different things tonight so we're here all of us to answer any questions that you folks may have and we're definitely looking for input as we move forward and prepare our site plan package. Thank you, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> we do have an opportunity tonight for public comment. If there's anyone here that would like to get up and speak on this topic, just please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Rachel, would you like to start off? Sure. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the uh, architectural designs. I think this is a very exciting project. Um, and I really appreciate uh, your approach to your work and, and to your staff. Uh, I think uh, as a longtime union organizer, um, we wouldn't have had as many members as we did if a lot of uh, the employers had taken the same sort of approach as you do. Uh, I do have, though, uh, a couple of questions that I, I guess are... Um, kind of foundational. One of the things that we talked about in terms of the development of these lots, the front lots, is that they would be relatively close to the street. That was, that was the assumption. And that if there were parking spaces, or that in general the parking spaces would be to the side or the back, that that was kind of the desired thing. And especially uh, on these four corners, uh, if you've had a chance to look at um, the square builders that uh, that came before us, you you see that it's the building is 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 right there. Uh, it is it is visual. The parking is to the rear. Could you tell me, you know, why you chose this sort of parking configuration with the parking in front of this building? Uh, for the cost, understand that, that you wanted a separation be, in a sense between the staff parking and the customer parking, but why in front? Uh, and then as you go along in general, I think you're going to have to take a look and tell me where uh, your snow, snow storage is going to be. Uh, to answer your first question, uh, with regard to placement of the building, uh, the option to try to slide the building forward really pushes everybody sort of along that side uh, area of the site. And as you come forward, you push the dock <coughs> forward. And so what happens is it kind of gets pinched. You really can't get the number of parking spaces that you would want to have without being right up against the dock. So as you come forward on the site, for us it felt really uh, much cleaner and better for placement of the building if we did have some of the parking in front of the building, recognizing that that's the nicer architectural treatment, et cetera. So if you sort of move it, I think one of the comments was to move the building to the southwest corner uh, of the property and kind of set it right on uh, that intersection. The dock location, the, the um, segregation with the employees to have them have a nice spot, you really kind of lose all of those amenities and it forces everything on the back side of the site which causes the need for more impervious and a difficulty, more difficulty in maneuvering in a dock area if we were to try to do the mirror image of the building. Now, I'm not clear I understand. I, 
let, let's say, why you did not move it further towards the southeast, rather than, in other so, words, just shift the building forward. Just south. Is that what you Yes. Mean? Just south. Just south. In doing that, what happens is you end up with the inability to have a green space, um, as you can see on the side of the building. As you can see with the full build-out plan, uh, parking is right between the access drive and the building. So when you take away the ability to have, there's a dozen parking spaces right now uh, in front of the building. When you take away that, you have to put those someplace. So those kind of get crammed in between the edge of the building and the um, private drive. So with this program, we do have some parking in front. We have an ample area for a nice green space, not only along the front of the building, but along that side of the building. Uh, that you see on the plan there that helps to kind of screen and buffer the loading areas, those types of things. Well, I'm actually not worried about screening the loading areas, um, simply because I think we are in an industrial area. They are set far enough back. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like you to consider what would happen if you just slid the building towards the street as the other building right across from it is uh, would that free up parking, whether it's staff parking or whatever, in the rear, leaving you still with customer parking along the um, private access road? Is that something that's that's possible, so that the building, which I'm I'm really anticipating is going to be lovely, um, is a lot uh, more visible from the street without the parking there. I understand the, the comments and, and the direction that you're going with that. To, to put the parking up to the rear of the building, sliding everything forward and sort of picking that up, introduces your employees coming through the back of the building. And as Daniel mentioned, he wants his employees to be coming through that upscale front entrance of the building to, to really um, you know, have their, their daily visits to work a positive one. Uh, and so that was something that, that the applicant felt very strongly about to make sure that everybody as his employees come in through that main entrance through the building, separating out the functional needs in the dock area at the rear of the building. So the staff parking is to the south and the customer parking is to the west? There are 18 parking spaces provided. Daniel currently has 10 employees and projects that he would have about five more at full uh, expansion, leaving about three for customer parking. So. It's the employees who will be coming out uh, primarily along the front and the side of the building to access at the front of the building. If that remains your design, um, then I'm really going to be looking at uh, a, lot, a lot more robust buffering. Very well. Uh, I like the idea of parking inside the building uh, so that the folks can unload the day before or load the day before and unload the, the day after. Um, I'm not as worried about the length of the curb cuts because, again, it's industrial uh, and you need to be able to get trucks in. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Roger. Um, I actually was going to ask the same question that Rachel just asked, but. Um, I will um, wait to see what your next presentation is. Uh, I'm, I'm not as um, keen on the robust uh, buffering uh, because I'm expecting the architecture of the building to be very attractive. Mm -hmm. And um, I, th I think that's, especially on that corner, it's going to be, I'm looking forward to it being very attractive coming into that area. So uh, I'm sure, I assume that it's going to be a berm or something separating the street from the parking area in the front? Um, uh, something like that? We haven't finalized grades uh, in that particular area. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that the building is going to be sitting up a little bit higher uh, than the street line itself, and so we can look at what can be done to help uh, screen the, the cars, if you will, but give that nice prominence for the building. Okay. Um, are the employees there most of the day, or are they out on the road somewhere? Uh, thanks. Uh, we have a combination of both. I mean, we're to a degree 24-7 uh, these okay. days. 
Um, so um, we all wear many hats, to say the least. So we're, we're there during the day. I mean, uh, a lot of these jobs require lots of phone calls and emails during normal working hours. Um, so we have staff that's sort of on site. We have staff that's on site. Uh, we have warehousing staff. Uh, but also those folks will also come up into the office and vice versa. So it's, it's a hard thing to define uh, the, event, the event business in, in our industry. Okay. A um, lot of running around per se. Uh, so. So, so this will be your, your national headquarters when you expand. National headquarters, headquarters, right here in Scarborough, Maine. <laughs> you got it. Um, so yes, um, and, and, and as a side point, I don't know if I, if I should continue to speak on this, but so the, the comment of moving the building uh, to, towards the road, um, uh, totally understand the idea of the parking along the front. Actually, it was one of my desires, believe it or not, although I think our priorities are different, uh, to have parking along the roadways and not against the building because I wanted my folks that are in their offices to look out their windows and not be looking at cars. So maybe I shouldn't admit to that because now I'm pushing it to the street where everybody else has to look at it. But that was part of the, the design, again, is to provide the, guy, the, the folks in the building, um, you know, not looking at the, the windshield of a car. Um, and the thought of is if we push that building towards the road, um, we sort of lose that front entrance as far as people being able to park and come in through that versus if they're on the side or the back, they'd have to walk around to uh, access the front of the building, so. Well, the good news for your employees, when they do look out the window, they'll see an attractive building across the street. They'll, yeah, they'll, <laughs> our building will be nicer than theirs. Okay, <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> now we're um, have content. I, I, do have, I do have another question. Maybe this pertains more to Dan. On the, uh, the private roads, uh, refresh my memory. Um, you know, I recall as, you know, in the original plans, there were maybe f like three or four lots going in on those private roads. Now, what if somebody is in that back lot and they want to walk out to Innovation Way? Are there gonna be sidewalks along those private roads? Yeah, we talked about that during the subdivision process and yeah. wanted to wait till site plan so that we knew layouts of lots. In some cases, there's going to be walkways that um, can connect building to building. Um, in other cases, there won't be. There'll be long stretches of kind of loading docks in, in areas that aren't connected walkways. So um, after this, this meeting uh, this evening, we know a number of the end users that are interested in lots on this private drive. So we're gonna kind of take a higher level view at how to provide some pedestrian accommodations um, along this private drive. Um, because, you know, we, didn't, we don't know exactly how sites are gonna be laid out. Um, and so now that we are getting your feedback tonight, we have some other end users that we have a sense for how they're gonna be laid out, we can figure out how best to provide some amount of pedestrian uh, movement along the private drive. Um, we know that there aren't kind of coffee shops and breweries um, planned on these lots. That was one of the conversations around, okay, having good pedestrian access to, to retailers or restaurants or things that might be here, that might happen on another block. So um, I think there's some potential for pedestrian activity, but there's also um, probably more potential for cars and trucks using these private drives. So we need to kind of balance where it makes sense to spend a lot of money on walkways and where it makes sense sure. to um, you know, work with the site plans. Well, I, I, I did notice that they have a walkway going out to Innovation Drive. They do, yeah. yep. And the but plan was, is to have yeah. a, uh, a mailbox and a kiosk for the whole project, so they, they'll have a quick walk to, if they get paper mail. Check their paper mail. Okay, so. Okay, I'm all set. I think it's very exciting. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Rick. Yeah, I'm glad to see another lot being taken up. This is pretty exciting. Uh, just a couple of um, things that I'd like you to consider as you're, you're doing your architectural. Um, don't know if you're doing a flat roof or is it going to be a pitched? Do you have a guess on that? We do, yeah. Flat? It's, it's converted into pitch, but it's one in quarter. quarter. I need to have people to speak into the microphone, otherwise the people at home 
all of them watching you can't hear you. Are people at Next. Home? <laughs> uh, it's a quarter 12. Yes, so a quarter of an inch every 12 inches, right? Did I say that right? Yes. yes. So it's very close to flat, but it is still pitched, yes. So when you come back to us with a more detailed plan, could you put where you might, uh, probably not going to put a rooftop unit on that building, so you're probably going to have to put some slab or some sort of carrier unit on a slab for your ventilation and everything. Can you make sure that's drawn in here and, and fenced up so that it can't be seen from... Um, yeah. Center Street, I think it is. Yeah, I can tell you, I think I can fairly speak fairly confidently. Um, so the offices will be uh, uh, controlled via VRF. VRF, VRF so, system? Yeah. And, yep. um, and so in that location of that, uh, that unit will be um, uh, on the sort of the patio side, uh, so I guess the uh, Easter side, side uh, of, of the building. Um, and then actually we're looking, uh, the, the plan currently is to put um, what we would uh, define as an air rotation unit, which is actually a completely self-contained unit that resides inside the building uh, 100%. Uh, it does have a, a small venting out of the, uh, the, uh, the roof, but uh, no outdoor elements. Uh, well, you're going to have to bring in makeup air, so at some point you're going to have to bring in fresh air. We'll bring Peter up to the table for this one. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Hi, Peter Boy, Ms. Uh The unit will have, have uh, it, it goes right on the outside of the building. It brings in air at that location. So, okay. so the, all the venting will be right behind the unit. Yeah, okay. So wherever you put the outside units for the VRF, just want to annotate that on the plans and maybe consider keeping it fenced out so it can't be seen or readily uh, a rock thrown into yeah, it or whatever. Yeah, it's a pretty small unit. It's like two by four, not, not as large as what you call it. So. 24,000 square feet, yeah. Try to get one with a heat recovery on it. If, if, if that, that unit is only for the office space. Okay. Um, the other thing, and I think you've annotated that, is on the, uh, the photometrics will be needed so that we can uh, check on the lighting levels yes. and make sure that there's some ways to control those lights so that they can be dimmed at appropriate times and actually help your electric bill a little bit. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. So um, I don't have a whole lot to add on to the comments of my colleagues here. Just for the sake of... Um, playing around with the plan just a little bit at sketch here. Um, how critical is access from that front parking lot to the back uh, trailer area? And I only ask because I, just visually, if you turn the, um, what looks like a C, if you turn that over, you, it looks to me like you can get a ton more green space right there. I mean, you already have two curb cuts being proposed. What's the purpose of the connectivity from one drive to the other? Because I don't believe many of your clients would drive back to where you're loading trailers. I could be wrong, but I'm just I'm looking at the impervious surface here and saying, you know, sure. there might be an opportunity here for more of that green space, especially if you're going to request two curb cuts. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, we're at sketch, so you guys can figure out your best design. I, I will say that I do agree with um, a lot of staff comments here. That's that's a really big opening. Um, and I appreciate you saying you're willing to kind of uh, look at the size of that curb cut, see if there's anything more you can do with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think Ms. Ms. Chair, if I can just yes. answer your question about sort of severing the front from the rear, I think is what you're, you're looking at for there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at that sort of white box that's mm -hmm. by the loading area, there you'll see the pavement goes right up to the building just south of that uh, concrete pad. Mm -hmm. And that's actually an at-grade overhead door so that if a customer came and just needed to pick up a small piece of equipment, they could pack their personal vehicle up to that door and come in. So that is why there is a connection there uh, between the two. Uh, so we certainly will look at ways to improve the um, lesson, if you will, the amount of impervious area on the site, uh, and also to look at ways to try to tighten up those curb cuts uh, for that. We do want to make sure, obviously, we get public safety vehicles in and that we you know, have appropriate maneuvering in the dock area and sort of for the p pieces of activity that are going on there. But uh, certainly your point is well taken. Thank you. 
And, uh, you um, know, can I jump in? You may. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I just want to make sure the applicant has direction as they prepare their site plan. So the three issues that I noted were uh, the number of curb cuts, the width of them, and the parking amount. So I just want to make sure that they, uh, they're, they know what to, what to do next. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, my next comment was going to be the parking. <laughs> uh, so we, um, we need to, as a board, make sure that uh, we're all set with the proposed 18 spaces versus 55, which is a, which is a large difference. Um, I personally, just for the record, I, I feel like, you know, applicants can best tell us how they believe they're going to use their space. Um, and I know why we have the ordinances written the way they are, but um, I do feel more comfortable knowing that we have an alternate plan in place if something out this would ever change ownership. There is an ability to get those parking spaces in there for whatever required. That's where I lean. Anyone else want to weigh in on the parking? No, I, I, I agree with you. The uh, the owner knows what uh, what he needs, but it's good for us to know that, or another person coming along, perhaps. 40 or 50 years from now to buy the building, um, that there are alternatives. I'm in concurrence. Thank you. Mr. So, Chair, yes. I could add an, an approach to that uh, is we will be providing you with our proposed site plan that shows the number of parking spaces and the alignment, et cetera, that we're proposing for the site. And then in addition, as part of our package, there would be an exhibit drawing in that that would take this site plan and show in dashed lines where the expanded parking might be. I think that will help with clarity rather than trying to show those dashed lines on the site plan itself. So with your permission, that's our approach to that, uh, for that. I'm comfortable with that, yeah. Um, and then, you know, as, J as uh, Jamel has alluded to, um, you know, clarity between, you know, the number of curb cuts, uh, this board needs to make sure that you know, they didn't come back with a design that has two curb cuts and then we decided to change our mind that they should only have one later on. I think it would be only fair to try to hammer this out a little bit right now. Um, are, we, are we okay with the current two, two cut design or proposal? Roger. I, I am based on what Dan described, how they envision this, um, these private roads being set up. Uh, I'd be kind of curious to see what it looks like when they come back. I do agree, though, that they should try and reduce it as much as they possibly can and still make it practical for their, for their business. Right. Well said, Roger. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, we have to remember this is a private access drive. Um, we're not looking at curb cuts on a main road. Um, so I think given it's in an, an industrial area, um, a private access road, the two curb cuts are fine if you can scrunch them down a little bit. Thank you. So I believe that's most of the clarity you'll, you'll need at this point from us. I would just um, remind this board that we do want to kind of, um, with this opportunity, we're seeing the first uh, one and two of these lots being developed. Um, while each lot is individual and special to an owner's needs out there. I don't want to see this board take, um, I'd hate to see us not apply the same standards to everyone else that comes in after this. So I think we should really kind of think long and hard about sidewalk requirements. Um, what's, what's good for one, is it good for another? Because we can't, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to say we're going to require them on this lot and then the lot in behind it, we can all of a sudden waive it. Uh, so I think we want to feel, you know, feel like there should definitely be some consistency here. While there might not be a coffee shop on this private way, the people that work on this private way might want to walk over to Innovation Way to get their coffee. So um, just keep all of that in mind that we have, you know, at the start of this very large build-out plan, we kind of have to set the tone for what we expect, and uh, hopefully we can remain consistent. And that way when uh, the applicant continues to, well, not the applicant, but the developer continues to market these, they're, they're definitely aware in the and the people who want to purchase into this area are aware of what the expectation levels are going to be going forward. So just food for thought on that. Rachel. Yeah, um, it just occurred to me, is there a trailhead at the end of this private access road? There is not. The next uh, trailhead is actually further to the west uh, towards where the pond is being constructed. I, I think um, certainly 
where there is a trailhead at the end of, a, of one of these access ways, we need, we need sidewalks. But I take your point about being consistent otherwise. Uh, I would say if, if there is a trailhead, we really do want the sidewalks. Um, I'm not clear how we want to treat them right now. Yeah, and, I, and again, whether it ends up on one side of the road and we just designate it right out of the gate, if it ends up, you know, on both sides, I, you know, we, we should put some, a little bit of thought into how we, we approach that as these, these applications start rolling in. Roger. Um, this, this doesn't pertain to sidewalks, but just as a, a suggestion uh, in the future, this, this is more for Dan, I think, than, than you, Nancy. In the future, as we see more of these lots being developed, I, I know from my point of view, it would be helpful to see the overall. The running tally of where Well, the overall are. layout. To, mm -hmm. to know exactly where they're being positioned, you know, so. And I, I do want to kind of piggyback on that. I do appreciate the fact that you're willing to look at the people who are approaching you and taking that 30,000 foot view. Um, we learned from the first application we just had at last meeting that the position of their driveway, and it might not, you know, on this private way it might not be applicable because that one was on a, a public road, mm -hmm. but the positioning of a driveway can impact all the other mm -hmm. lots, cascading factor all the way down might not be as big of an impact on some of these private ways, but we should also keep that in mind. So when you do step back and take that overall view, you know, what we're proposing in each of these, how it does impact the, the lots around them. So appreciate that as well. Roger. So this again for Dan, so can we assume that every time we have a meeting, you're, you're gonna be bringing another one in front of us, another business? <laughs> yeah, <true>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we hope so. <laughs> Uh, with that said, I think we've probably covered most of everything um, you'll need for this point going forward. We look forward to a resubmission, and just want to say thank you. Um, you know, appreciate your story, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've chosen to come back to Scarborough for the, your business, and uh, thank you very much. Thank Good you. luck, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to do a uh, five-minute recess before we get to our last item of the evening. Uh, we'll we'll uh, recess and be back shortly. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. Um, our next item tonight is Ballantyne Development LLC requests a site plan review for lots 128A and 128B, North Village, Assessor's Map RO73, Lot 21A. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project is located in the TND uh, zoning district, um, the northern portion of the approved Eastern Village subdivision. Uh, the applicant was last before you all in July. Just as a reminder, the applicant's proposing to construct uh, five uh, multifamily residential buildings uh, consisting of 84 apartments served by a public street. The proposal also includes uh, numerous garages, a community building, dog park, nature trails, and a new public street with sidewalks on both sides. So as previously noted back in July, uh, the zoning standards do require sidewalks to be connected to pedestrian amenities in any abutting neighborhoods. Uh, so to this end, the applicant is in the pro process of uh, completing a concept design for a sidewalk along Ward Street uh, to connect the Eastern Village with the municipal campus. Also as requested, the applicant um, noted that they updated the building designs, um, so the applicant should be sure to discuss these modifications uh, and the board should be sure to provide feedback on the proposed designs. Staff would like to point out that the proposed development is located within phase eight of the approved Eastern Village subdivision. So staff recommends that the applicant provide the board with an update on the approved phasing plan and if this project is to be constructed and occupied prior to other phases uh, within the project. And the applicant has also noted that they're in the process of conducting a traffic analysis for the project and will provide this uh, with future submissions to the board. And um, there were numerous letters from the public, thank you, and those have been received and distributed uh, to the board this evening. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Kerry? Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Kerry Anderson, representing Valentine Development, and we are here again, as uh, Jamel has just uh, mentioned, since July. We've made changes to the architecture to address some of the concerns that were raised at the last meeting. In addition to that, we have received our federal NERPA permit, and we should receive our state permit any day now. We have met with fire department and public safety and uh, taken any of the concerns that they have into account, made changes to the plan. And um, in addition to that, we have um, looked at some of the uh, aspects of what the staff had asked us to make for changes uh, with respect to the right of way going down through the, the uh, neighborhood from 20 feet to the 22 feet. Uh, we are uh, proposing sidewalks on both sides. We have changed the parking arrangement up around building four so that we could have a park area between the sidewalk and the parking. And we looked at the area down around building two, which was asked of us at the last meeting, and we didn't really see a way to uh, change that to make any appreciable uh, change to uh, what you see today with respect to parking distance from the building and whatnot. And um, with that, I've seen the comments from the uh, public. I'm happy to address those uh, when you want to with any issues there. Uh, with that, I guess I would uh, ask to see what the board would like to talk about. Sure, I think um, before you, <clears throat> um, you step away, can you do a architectural overview for the board? I know that's one area of concern. Uh, that's been brought up through the public and, and through the membership itself. Sure. With me tonight is Sean McGilvery, who is the architect for North Village. Uh, he is not the architect of record for South Village, so this is a different architect on this particular project here. Also here tonight is Caleb Barassa. Steve Bushy could not be here. Caleb Barassa is here to answer any engineering questions. Uh, we have a thumb drive. Can we uh, use that to? Uh, okay.
Sean McGilvery, IKM Architects. So looking at the perspective you have up here on the screen, we've taken some steps here to address concerns and um, comments regarding the massing along with the fenestration on the buildings, trim, and casing. What we've done uh, as a first step with the massing is on particularly the buildings two and four, which are on the left-hand side, we've added a layover gable to break up the long facade along the town road. In addition, we've, we've looked at creating a, a podium, we'll call it, as the ground floor by adding trim just above the first floor windows, which gives it a, a, a different appearance from a three-story structure. We're trying to enlarge the trim to set it off from the rest of it. So we have a, a two over one configuration is what we're looking at. In addition to, to that, we've, um, we, can look at, we can look at some detail of the, the exteriors of the buildings and, and what we've added to those to um, address the concerns about, about the size of the facade and the comparison to South Village. This is quite different than South Village and we'll get into showing the difference between these two so you can better understand um, what we're proposing here today. Get the elevations? Uh, yes. All right. If we can open up the uh, larger file. I think I'm a village. Uh, if you can scroll down to the elevations. <coughs> so, for comparison here, so building one here, building one, we've, um, as, I, as I mentioned, we've added the banding above, there's a banding of trim above the first floor windows. And also, we've um, adjusted the gable end, uh, so it has a full pediment. And in addition to that, we've offset the actual siding in the gable end to give it a, a different appearance from the rest of the body. So we're making these moves to sort of break down the overall massing. Uh, building one is the simplest of them all, uh, and, but it's also the, the smallest uh, in, in footprint. On um, we get, we'll, later on, I'll show you the I'll show the cornice detail on this. But building one from what you've seen before to now, the biggest difference I've mentioned, and then the entryway has has been widened to give it a, a better stance in the front uh, as you as you pull up to the front and the south the south elevation from the parking lot. If we can go on to buildings two and four, those have a little bit more of a, a difference we can we can see. So in buildings two and four, looking at this and think here in the comments and concerns on the street face, we've added a, what's referred to as a layover gable on the roof. And then from there, we've continued trim down all the way to the ground on either side. So we've broken this up into thirds. Also, once again, attacking the massing saying, you know, how can we make this more visually uh, uh, interesting? The balconies we've we've seen but you've, you've seen before the cornice has been updated, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And then the grouping of the windows. This is on the north side, but we also looked at that. There was a little, you know quite a bit of windows in a row. We looked at it and said you know yes we can make this a little more interesting. Let's group a few of the windows together. That's on the back side of the building, so you'd be in the woods to see that for the most part. On the street side though, um, is got the biggest change with the widened entry and the the gable layover. Uh, if we go on to three and four, three and five rather, three and five, same treatment we've talked about. And uh, this one actually reduced in footprint. We made some modifications to the layout um, on the uh, one bedrooms and the two bedroom units. So it's smaller than you originally had seen um, by I believe uh, 12 feet in length and six feet in front to back. 
beyond that, um, you know, change the changes we discussed so far, adding the cupolas to the roof. Those are the those are the big ones on on three and five. At this scale, you're not going to notice the the cornice, but that's the next piece I'd like to discuss, which uh, we can we can flip to now. It, if, is that the rest of it, or is there another? So looking at this, this is roughly what we would see at South Village for comparison. So we wanted to give you a side-by-side -side since a lot of the comments where we're comparing this to South Village. Our corner boards are, are wider than what is at South Village currently, it's two inches wider. The water table would be the same, uh, proportionally that works. We're adding the, the banding above the first floor windows. The window trim itself is going to have a brick mold on it and also be wider than what's, uh, what's currently installed at South Village. So we're talking about at least an inch to an inch and a half wider there. And on the first floor level, there will be a cap trim. So if we go on to the next slide here, we can see the difference. So this is what we're proposing at North Village. So you can see right away, it's quite a bit more trim. We've, we've taken the first floor level and treated it different than the rest, so everything gets the brick mold uh, that's enlarged there on the lower right-hand side. The first floor gets a cap trim to give it a nice shadow line. And then on the, the corner boards we discussed being larger and all of the entablature, cornice, and rake are multi-piece and done to classic proportions for this size building. So we're talking about a overall entablature that I believe is about two foot six, whereas uh, it was uh, a foot less on South Village. So it's quite a different look. It's, it's, it's you know, between the rendering, it's, it's sketch rendering, so it's hard to say, you know, you know, this is what it's gonna be, but this is actual drawing, so you can look at this and say, oh, okay, this is what we're gonna see and this is why it's different. And if we went back to the previous South Village comparison, you can see it's a lot thinner. So we're not, we're not attacking it from that way. We're saying this is going to be, um, is, is going to be a lot more detail to this building, these buildings. That concludes the, the items that we had uh, addressed as, as part of the comments and concerns to architectural. Uh, I think at this point, do we open up to comments at this point, Kerry? Uh, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, no, I guess the only thing I'd say is I was happy with the architecture prior. Um, again, it's a federal style, and um, I like federal style. This, uh, this certainly is an enhancement, significant enhancement. Okay, thank you. Um, at this point, we do have opportunity for public comment. Uh, if you'd like to speak, we're going to ask that you limit your comments to four minutes, please. I do a little courtesy tap when you've got 30 seconds to go, and that means wind it down for us. Um, what you have to do is just step up, state your name, and then let us know what it is you're thinking. Appreciate it. And if we could try to um, limit comments to the plans that we're looking at, it would be appreciated. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not going to check my email. I'm just going to start the timer. <laughs> <laughs> you may do that if you want to. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm an attorney at Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry, and I'm here tonight representing Nancy Pack and Jim Marshall, who live at 7 Inspiration Drive. Uh, their property is directly south of the proposal. Um, at most of my comments, you can look at the landscaping plan, which is C6, and if you were looking at that, um, well, it's not highlighted on yours, but you can see where Inspiration Drive is, and they're the second one in from Ballantyne. Um, I'm going to start by talking about Section 7 of the Zoning Ordinance, which applies to this project because of the multiplex aspect of it. Section 7.B.7 requires inviting public spaces exhibiting human elements and scale. Um, B, subsection B8 requires a landscape program that illustrates, illustrates the proposed aesthetic treatment of space, roads, paths, service, and parking areas. 
The landscaping plan shows landscaping along the street near some of the buildings and around some of the parking areas. Doesn't show any landscaping at the property lines, which obviously is of great concern to my clients and, and other residents of the single family homes that abut this proposal. Because the density of the project is so much higher than that of the single family homes abutting it, the planting plan should be a term that I've heard this board use several times tonight, much more robust than it is. Uh, and certainly there should be plantings along the single family residences, all of them. I think right now the only one that has any significant amount of buffering uh, is the one on Ballantyne Drive. And honestly, that's there because otherwise they'd be directly adjacent to the parking lot. So obviously they would want, you would want a buffer there. Uh, the buffer can consist not just of planting, but it also can include, a f it can include fencing under your ordinance. Uh, possibly a berm could be considered, which would certainly help somewhat with noise that's going to come from the parking areas. A project that has higher density is supposed to use its residual open space for active or passive recreation under Section 7B10. The only amenity that I've been able to identify on the plan, although perhaps I'm missing something, is the dog park. Um, certainly a dog park is a nice amenity, but it's limited as to its users. Um, we did not see other plans for active recre and passive recreation use, although there, I know there's been some discussion about trail connections. The remainder of the open space appears to be wetlands, which are not usable for either active or passive recreation. They, they are required to be kept largely open because they're wetlands. Uh, the TND standards in section uh, 16A, subsection B2, require a minimum of 10 to 20 percent active or passive recreation area, uh, and I was not able to determine how that was met um, on the plans that I reviewed. Under the site plan requirements, um, we understand that a traffic study is underway and will be presented to the board at a future meeting, but I'm sure this board can appreciate that the neighbors are particularly concerned about the impact of 84 new units um, on the intersections that are going to be impacted, particularly as some of those intersections are already uh, at level of service D or below level of service D. The design and layout of the parking areas under the site plan ordinance are supposed to compl sorry, complement adjacent buildings to the site. Um, as I mentioned before, there's not much screening around there. Um, the plan is supposed to use buffering to minimize adverse impacts or nuisances on the site or from adjacent areas. Uh, we don't see the standards met under the current plan and configuration. Um, buffers should be used to shield structures and uses. Um, from the view of budding properties, I discussed that already. Um, and then as far as the architecture is concerned, it should follow traditional New England building forms, but it also should be complementary of what adjoins it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate it. It was, excuse me, can we just clarify? Yes. Who are you representing in this? Nancy Pack and Jim Marshall. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jim Marshall. I live at 7 In Inspiration Drive, and I'm one of the abutters to this property. And um, I just want to start out by saying that we moved to Eastern Village because of the design standard and the aesthetic of the neighborhood. And what has been created is a community of homes that are complementary to one another. Uh, and uh, it's made, a, I think, just a really special community here in Scarborough. Um, this creates a certain fabric that is um, one which enhances uh, our quality of life. It enhances that neighborhood feeling. It also enhances, frankly, home values as well. And uh, I really worry that Northern Village would uh, detract from, from the community feeling because it doesn't live up to the same design standard that uh, was created in the community at, at, at large. Um, three story, the three-story aspect of this development may be up to the code or to the whatever um, uh, code the town has as far as 
building height, but I know that our house is two stories tall and all the other uh, buildings in that I know of, I can't think of a three-story building in our development as well. We'll be able to see this from our patio in the back of our house. Um, and I would, you know, I think at the very least, there needs to be a lot more in terms of buffering and uh, sort of isolation. The, the elevation that was shown by the architect faces the street from my understanding. Uh, we're not looking at the street, we're looking at the backs of those buildings behind us. Um, and uh, I would also like to just look at the, some of the scale of the property. You know, they, they, these are buildings which perhaps some of them do have some, uh, some design elements, but I feel like it's, they are still quite box-like in, in, in the way that they, they were constructed. Um, and finally, uh, the massing of 84 units in that space behind us, it just seems like a very, very high number of, uh, of, of buildings to also, or units to put in, you know, again, right literally in my backyard. So um, I just would like to see, you know, again, buffering, uh, something that adheres more. I mean, it may be a simple federal style, but really it doesn't look anything like the buildings. I have a federal style house. These buildings do not complement the style or the design of my house. So I'd just like to see something that's more in tune with that and at the very least some uh, more robust buffering between my property line and, and what I'm seeing in my backyard. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Carolyn Inglis, and I live at 4 Traditional Street. We were initially drawn to Eastern Village, partly because our daughter lives there, and she wanted us to be here as well, which in and of itself was fairly amazing. Um, we were drawn also by the variety of houses, by the gardens, by the care, by the neighbors, the sidewalks, and a feeling of neighborhood. Uh, when we were building our home, we were told that we had to adhere to design standards. And when we asked the developer where we could look at those, he said, they're right up here, which made it difficult for us to proceed without again and again getting his okay. Clearly, the standards, however, have not been applied to Southern Village. Aesthetically barren, and we've heard it called barracks, or institutional housing. Um, they have no buffering, no landscaping, no personality, and certainly very high density. Two houses adjacent to South Village, th their front doors actually face these buildings. They used to have open space, which I think could have been helped partially by having those buildings two stories high rather than three. Southern South Village looms, and it looms large. When we have friends or family come to visit, they say, what a great place, but what is that? Um, we've come to find that the developer did not develop and build the plans that the planning board approved. He took buildings out, he changed things, which I find appalling and an insult to all of you, as well as an insult to the residents of Eastern Village. Lessons learned. If you can't handle a South Village, how on earth is he going to handle 84 apartments in North Village? Will he build the design that you approve? Who knows? I have to say he's leaving many things unfinished in Eastern Village itself. He's abutting Eastern Village with two sets of huge, overpowering apartment complexes. My issues aren't with the apartments themselves. Instead, I have cause to pause because they are so high so that he can have more apartments, so he can collect more rents for his retirement, as he has said, but I ask, when he's reneged on myriad other promises and assurances, why trust him now? Thank you.
My name is Rick Hirschman. I live at 8 Inspiration Drive in the Eastern Village. The architecture of the houses in Eastern Village is striking, incredible examples of fine detail. People who encounter in Eastern Village for the first time are amazed. One planning board member at your July meeting complimented Kerry and said he pays attention to detail. Um, I'm going to skip forward because I didn't realize that there were going to be some new plans here. But the architecture, as we all know, in South Village is atrocious. Um, the architecture in Eastern Village has a high degree of detail. The architecture in South Village doesn't even meet the definition of federal. If you look up the, if you go to Google and look up federal architecture, you won't find anything that looks like Southern Village or South Village. Uh, and you've also heard them called uh, barracks. Um, I, ha I took pictures of all of the white houses that were near the center part of Eastern Village, so you can get a, a, a comparison because at the last meeting, uh, some people had not seen South Village, and I wanted to show you the, the comparison uh, between the two. Um, it, it isn't, uh, some of these, some of these new uh, design elements look a little bit nicer, but they're still looming and they're still big buildings. Uh, my mother, my in-laws built a, built a house and my mother-in-law had not seen the back of the house because of the way that it, it approached, it was on the water. She asked me what it looked like. Well, we're gonna be looking at the back of, this ha of all of these buildings. I think the backs of the buildings need to look as good, nice as the front of the buildings. Um, at the July 1st meeting, Kerry admitted that the buildings in South Billings were, and I quote, I went back to listen to the tape today, uh, not as good as they could look. And so I don't know whether there's any solution there or not, um, but they certainly don't look good. There's a great disparity between what the residents of Eastern Village have to do and what Kerry Anderson himself does not follow. Uh, on the third page there, there's a picture of the air conditioning units in South Village. Um, those are, those are, have to be concealed in Eastern Village. And carry, by Kerry's own design, those are, those virtually cannot be concealed in the locations that they are. And they're behind every building, and when you drive in from Eastern Road, that's the first thing you see, the air conditioning units. So he's not following his own recommendations. Uh, because of the need, apartments in Scarborough are probably going, all going to be um, rented out regardless of whether, what they look like. But, and the taxes on the buildings are going to be the same. But the, if the tax appraisals on our houses go down because they're close to ugly buildings, then the town of Scarborough is going to have less tax income because the market value of our houses will go down. So it will have an impact on the town of, of Scarborough. Um, every person in this room I, that, that has, well, not every person, but every, everyone who's lived in Eastern Village knows that Kerry has a very difficult time in finishing projects. And he's also said he wants to move to California. I certainly hope that the town of Scarborough has protected itself and its citizens because we don't want another thing like the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Press Herald set, uh, had an article on it on the Legends development that went bust. Um, at an Eastern Village neighborhood meeting last fall, a top, one of the topics was North Village. Kerry was at that meeting and, uh, and said that the, um, the, the problem, I'm sorry, the problem was that when, what he presented to the people, the residents at that time, was not what he presented to the planning board. So he comes to you and he says, I've met with people with, my, with the neighborhood. Well, he did meet with the neighborhood. He just didn't tell them, tell us what he submitted to you for his plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm James Inglis. I live at 4, uh, four Traditional Street in Eastern Village. Uh, 
I strongly support the need for whatever re remediation is possible on uh, South Village in terms of uh, it not being built the way it was promised to be built. I don't know what's possible, but I think that, as, long as, as well as completion of all the activities there in terms of landscaping, et cetera, needs to be done. The other thing that needs to be done uh, is completion of all the common areas, the roads, the infrastructure, the utilities in Eastern Village. That's been delayed forever. Uh, the developer makes promises and then doesn't deliver. Uh, that needs to be done. Both of those things need to be done before anything is begun at all in a North Village project, however that North Village project turns out to be. Okay. Let me talk about a couple of aspects of the, uh, of the, uh, 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 the North Village plan. Okay. The basic thing is that the full length of the road there, uh, what is it? Uh, Camden. Camden, I'm sorry, Camden, Camden. That needs to be completed before any structures are uh, built there. That road needs to be completed at both ends that needs to be phase one of the project. The reason for that is uh, several. One is safety. Okay. In, the, in the event of a fire or emergency need while construction is going on on, on the buildings, okay, uh, it's much quicker to get there via the Ward Street entrance rather than having to go out and around on Commerce and then come in Valentine and around. So there's a safety aspect to getting that whole road completed. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that when people begin to occupy the residence, they will be able to drive in and out of both ways uh, of the area. Uh, according to the current plan, phase two, that the end up towards Ward is built sometime in the indefinite future, okay, that's inappropriate. The, the, if that's done, then all the access will, for residents will have to be via Commerce Street and Valentine Drive. Okay. Again, important to complete that whole road initially before anything is built. Okay. Let me talk about parking. Okay. I think all aisles in the parking lot should be 25 feet as specified in the town ordinances. There's no reason to uh, decrease them for an exception. People have big vehicles, they buy SUVs, they buy uh, trucks. Uh, there's uh, you know, emergency vehicles, again, there's a safety issue of being able to fully access in those parking areas. I think a 25-foot aisle is perfectly appropriate, and there's no reason to decrease the size of, of that. Okay. Uh, there's a question about parking uh, for the uh, 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 community center and the dog park. There doesn't seem to be any parking identified for those two common features. Uh, uh, if, if the question is, if, if this is supposed to be available, uh, as the developer has stated, to Eastern Village and even Southern Village people, uh, they're not all going to walk there, they're going to drive there, and there needs to be parking available for those common facilities, okay? especially things like bad weather, snow, and so on. Also, the angled parking that is up uh, uh, in the upper right-hand corner there, it's really an inconvenient, uh, uh, it seems kind of jammed in there, uh, inconvenient in terms of its uh, distance to the closest uh, apartment building. The design for that should be rethought. Okay. Turn to the dog park quickly. Dog park, too small. Requirements generally for five-foot fences rather than four-foot fences. Okay. Uh, water needs to be provided, benches need to be provided, those things need to be specified for this. It really should be about three times as large as it is to be a meaningful dog park. Okay. Community center needs rethinking. If it's just to serve a northern village, uh, it's probably too big. If it's supposed to serve the whole area, it, it uh, should be uh, uh, you know, made larger. And uh, the nature, let me just want, nature path as designed runs right down the construction dirt road that is used by the developer. Uh, it's certainly not a nature area. And uh, at 600 feet, it's hard to even call it a trail. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Portia Hirschman. I live at 8 Inspiration Drive. I've come before this board several times with regard to Eastern Village, and I've always commented on two things. One, the developer has a history of not completing common areas before moving on to the next phase. 
And second, the commitment to build affordable housing to gain additional density has not been done. Well, tonight is no different. On July 1st, the developer stood before this board and declared that within a few weeks, his site contractor would be back and get the new entrance and work on Eastern Road taken care of. Today, nothing has happened. On July 1st, the developer told this board that as soon as South Village apartment buildings were complete and occupied, which they all are, that site grading and landscaping would be completed. Hasn't happened, in fact, up to about 10 days ago, the sidewalks in a portion of South Village were indoor-outdoor carpeting, just as a, as a hint. Furthermore, trees required and streets um, and street lights that have not been installed, or in some cases installed but not connected, have not been done. The common areas are not done. Um, the park has not been seeded or graded. Um, people are getting frustrated, very frustrated. You see how many people have shown up tonight. We care. And what's happening is we have discovered in multiple meetings, we know Angela and Jay and Jamal very well, they've talked to us a lot of times, that the only way to get work completed, to get the paving done, the street lights and trees, was for us constantly to meet with staff and try to figure out how to make things happen. If you keep issuing permits, for new phases to open, work does not get done. And that takes up a lot of our energy and time. It takes up a lot of time and energy for staff. Please help us and stop doing this. The second issue is affordable housing. Developers have the option to increase density in subdivisions by committing to build affordable housing. And there are a long waiting lists for that. Vets, the elderly, new teachers, um, public uh, professionals and and we're looking at the the park and the downs this developer was given 39 additional homes to build 13 affordable units when questioned several years ago as to when affordable houses were going to be built he told the board he couldn't find anyone interested in buying them when he presented South Village to the board at the preliminary site review he made a point of saying there would be four affordable units in South Village there are no such units in South Village. Why? Scarborough residents may not be aware that the town allows developers to opt out of this commitment by quietly paying $20,000 per unit to a fund managed by the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Now I ask you, what can be built for $20,000? What real incentive is there for this housing to be built at all if the bar is set so low? Given that this developer was permitted to build an additional 39 homes in this development, weigh the profit potential of those homes versus the fee. For all the public talk about the desperate need for affordable housing, the fact that it is easy for developers to slip behind the curtain is, should be appalling to the residents of Scarborough. How much is being built? Not much. Eastern Village is the perfect place for affordable housing. It's walkable to schools, to the library, to shoppings, to public transit. It is the perfect location. Why isn't one, at least one of these 12 unit buildings being allocated to affordable housing? Why? You have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Norma Weinberg. I live at 2 Valentine Drive. I have a ring doorbell, so I decided to see how many cars go in and out of our neighborhood. The average amount of cars that go by my house every day in a 24-hour period runs from 432 to 519 cars. Walkers run anywhere from 30 to 59. Bikers run anywhere from 13 to 21. There are no speed limits, traffics in the neighborhood. At night, cars drive a lot more fast, uh, drive faster through the neighborhood because when a car comes in on either side of my house, it takes about uh, 10 seconds to get th through my doorbell. But you can tell 
because cars will make it through in three seconds or five seconds. No speed limits. Please put in speed limits. Um, we were also told, as Portia said, on the July meeting that things would get done. The new entrance would go in. The new entrance hasn't been put in around uh, South Village. We have no landscaping around there. It's very barren looking. It's very sandy looking. That needs to be done. And since that's not done, there is also, I walk my dog at night. There's lots of lighting down where I live. There's lots of lighting, I think, up into traditional. But once you get up into South Village on uh, Federal Way, there's no light. It is pitch black there. The light poles are on. The lights are not lit. I don't understand that. I don't understand how this has gotten past everyone. Um, I already mentioned that, sorry. I got ahead of my notes. Um, Vista Street, which goes down around the pond, one whole section of that has been completed. I think it's Vista to Victorian Street is now totally completed. They don't have, uh, they don't have lighting either. There aren't even, I think there are maybe one pole, concrete pole set up for it but there's none on the other parts. There's no trees like the rest of the community. It's, it's, it's again, it's just kind of empty looking. Eastern Trail goes right by a house within probably a foot of a house. The trail's not done. It's kind of clovery, and then it goes out onto the other uh, part of uh, Eastern. But that's not done. Now, now he's working past Victorian Street, still going down on Vista. And there's two new homes in there, and I think two under construction. And yet, it's just things aren't getting done in the older areas. And I don't understand why, why this keeps happening because it's, it's not finished. And yes, I'm like everyone else here. I bought into this place because it's beautiful. It's charming. It has natural gas. It has city waters. It has all the things I wanted. And yet I feel for the people that live at the opposite end of me because it's not being taken care of. And it's not things that we as the homeowners can do, but it, it goes back to what our builder does. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Jim Houle and I'm a resident of Eastern Village at Two Traditional Street. And I'd like to comment on the dog park. Um, last autumn when Kerry presented the concept of Northern Village to the Eastern Village homeowners, I have to say I was very gratified to hear that there would be a dog park um, in the neighborhood. Because as you know, it's a high density neighborhood, which means high density dogs. And now with the presence of, Southern, of South Village, it's an even a higher density dog population. I think every tenant in South Village is required to have at least one dog personally. And there's evidence of the presence of dogs in our neighborhood. We'll walk around and look at the common areas um, and uh, the homeowner's lawns. But that's the nature of the beast, no pun intended. So I was happy to hear that there's a dog park, uh, possibly, on the horizon. But as I began to think about it, um, I have every confidence that Carrie will allow the residents of Eastern Village and South Village to use the dog park for their dogs, but nothing in life is permanent and eventually ownership will change. Either it will be sold or Carrie will pass it on to the next generation or whatever. And there is, as far as I know, no proposal that there is a legally binding obligation to continue to allow that dog park to be available to residents of Eastern Village and South Village. So I would urge 
the planning board as a precondition to approval of uh, North Village, if that is your decision, that there should be a recorded, legally enforceable right of way and use um, easement running to the residents of Eastern Village and South Village that allows us on a permanent basis to be able to use the dog park for our dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Nancy Pack, and I am a resident of 7 Inspiration Drive as part of Eastern Village. A lot of comments have been made already about prior uh, developments, um, and I just want to reinforce that many of us uh, neighbors uh, of that area have spoken about you know, the concern around unfinished pieces of the development, and the most recent being South Village. Uh, it is very difficult to drive off Black Point Road and go through that back entrance, Eastern Road, and then head towards you know, the, the, uh, Eastern, the actual Eastern Village development when you have uh, mounds of dirt, unpaved asphalt, uh, uneven surfaces to drive. And I did bring um, some show and tell. You can just scroll on the iPad to see what I'm talking about. I'm just going to pass that along. That is very difficult to look at daily. It's difficult to see kids walking, um, young kids walking along that area. They're walking through mounds of dust and again, piles of brick and other things. And if that is a foreshadowing of what North Village might look like if it actually gets built and, and finished, that's very concerning. I would not wanna have mounds of dirt, gravel, um, you know, uneven uh, roads especially if we're going to have roads that may connect the rest, you know, all the residents to the entire uh, development. So my urge is for the board to mandate that the developer finish commitments and whatever was written in the site plan for South Village to be completed first. Also, there were staff comments uh, for the um, staff comments uh, in the last meeting where comments about the Bessie Square Pond improvements that were not finished be finished before North Village is, be, uh, is started. So I'd add Bessie Square Pond and South Village improvements, landscaping, everything that was promised to be completed before North Village is even considered to be started. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the public? Seeing that I'm going to close public comment. I will say thank you all for uh, giving us your time and your thoughts on this. Appreciate it. And now we're going to turn it over to the board. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, thank you, um, Carrie. One of the um, one of the comments that was made uh, was that this is phase eight uh, in North Village. Um, this seems to me that it is out of the phasing plan. Could you talk about, since I wasn't on the board when this began, I think it would be helpful to get a framework for what the phasing plan uh, that you had looks like and why you decided to go directly to phase eight. Well, phasing on the project has changed a number of times. It changed as early as, uh, or as late as six months ago. Um, <clears throat> and uh, frankly, it's the demand. We get 400 calls a month. There's a massive housing problem. And for people that have got their house and thinking about where they're gonna spend their weekend and what they're gonna barbecue out and everything else like that, they don't have those concerns. But there are people who on a weekly basis, nightly basis, every weekend worry about what, where they're gonna live. That's the kind of demand that we have. And that's the reason why we decided to move forward with this. We never told anybody anything about this phase, what it was going to be, what it wasn't going to be, or anything like that. But it's the demand, the sheer demand for housing. Uh, any of these, I, there was one notation of affordable housing. Are any of these going to be affordable? No. Are you going to pay any in lieu of? 
we don't owe the in lieu on this. We've talked to the town about that. But you know, that's another, well, if we were proposing affordable housing, we'd be criticized for doing affordable housing. Um, but no, we're not proposing anything in here, and we've talked to the town about uh, that aspect of it, and we will follow through with, uh, with the in lieu fee for the rest of the project, um, if and when that comes available. We tried to do affordable housing. We tried back in, oh, back in 10 and 11. We held meetings here at the town. We advertised with the town manager and with planning staff in the paper throughout the town. We didn't have one person show up. It's not as easy as it sounds. They want to put it on somebody else, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not easy to do, and that's the reason why it's not happening. And imposing fees on developer like impact fees, I mean, the school impact fee on this project right here, close to $300,000, wipe that away. The sewer impact fee on this project, close to $250,000, wipe that away. If you want affordable housing, I think the town really needs to take a look and see what they can do to help developers make that happen. But they're not willing to do that. They want to get all the money themselves and at the same time cry about an no affordable housing. All right, I'm uh, looking at the one of the plans that shows the trail from the end of Ward Street, potentially down to Inspiration. Uh, on one of the plans, you note that the developer or the owner reserves the right to make that into a street. Why um, have you been considering making that into a street to take some of the pressure off of Ballantyne so as an exit onto uh, Route 1? I've considered it. I've not considered it. When we had the meeting that we held last uh, fall with the neighbors, one of the comments that was brought up was uh, not to connect that up. This will help Eastern Village. This, this North Village is gonna get the traffic. The, um, one of the folks have brought up the uh, issue of the size of the dog park. Is there a way that you could make that larger? No, we're not interested in making it larger. We've looked at what dog park sizes are. We had somebody work on that for us and the size of this dog park is what is traditionally used. And are you willing to have a, an article in the homeowners association or in the deed or whatever that states that that dog park is available in perpetuity to um, other homeowners of Eastern Village? I guess I take a look at it, consider it, but I'm not going to make any commitments to that. Um, the question has arisen on additional buffering. Have you considered that and are you willing to buffer additionally along the, especially the back areas um, where there would be visibility to the folks on Inspiration and Valentine? I think we're open to that. I believe there was a discussion about that when we met with staff earlier this year and we asked about along the buffer and for some reason it's not on there, but we're not opposed to looking at that. All right, another question, um, uh, by the way, an, an observation uh, about the, the current architecture, and that is I think it's a considerable improvement. Um, I would, I, in additional or further submissions, uh, it would be very helpful to me to visualize what the proposal looks like against some of the federal houses, for instance, some of these to see if indeed the architecture does harmonize with the federal architecture along inspiration. If that's possible, it would be very helpful. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what your question is, but let me say that there are townhouses in Eastern Village that are larger than these buildings. There are many, many homes in Eastern Village that are three stories. Eastern Village height is 45 feet, not 35 feet like you have in most parts of town. Eastern Village has bulk and space. And what is the height in these buildings? Um, I believe they're less than that, but um, you have townhouses in Eastern Village that are larger than some of these buildings right here in North Village. Uh, perhaps the architect could answer the question on what the height is on these buildings. Uh, they're called, uh, they're 45 or under, so we're hoping that. 
They're 10 foot per floor, and then you've got from the third floor plate up, so I'd say they're 42, 43 feet tall. The zoning in uh, Eastern Village is up, allows for 45 feet. Okay, and there are other buildings in Eastern Village that are 45 feet? Uh, I'm not sure if there are or not. Okay, um, somebody has raised, a couple of folks raised the question uh, about completion of some of the uh, some of the prior projects. Uh, I did drive into um, past uh, down Eastern Trail uh, and tried to make my way through Eastern Village along South Village and um, the condition in the South Village really is as described by the folks here. Can you tell me when that's going to be completed? Sure. Uh, we planned on finishing that when the last building was finished and that happened last week. The um, roads that you have in Eastern Village outside of Ginger Mews and a portion of Vista, the town has asked us not to put the surface pavement on. The lighting that we're being um, beat up on and told uh, to you that is not in place is in fact in place. It's been in place for months. We can't go and electrify those lights. That's up to CMP. Uh, the lighting in the last phase we put up, and it took a year for CMP to get out there. Angela can speak to these. She knows all about this. And um, as far as some of the other stuff is concerned, uh, we've got new development that's taken, just taken place in phase five. It got paved at the end of June, um, so you're not going to have uh, finished lights and other things over there when we just got the phase completed you know, two months ago. But the sidewalks are going to be completed in South Village when? Uh, South, well, we posted a check to the, to the town uh, uh, planner last week for those improvements. They'll be completed before year's out. Um, before the snow flies or before year's out? Before snow flies. Okay. If uh, it flies early, though, I mean, <laughs> as long as the pavement plants are open. It's our intention to finish South Village. I mean... It's it's not landscaped. It's not graded. Um, I think you, you've heard some of the concerns that, that you're precisely right. It's not landscaped and it's not mm -hmm. graded. Uh, and folks are concerned about that. Um, I did uh, some research uh, and the buildings are indeed what we seem to have passed. Um, That's right. For folks here, there were two different uh, period, there were two different times that the, you brought those to us. The original design that you had and then uh, a while later you brought a second design because you changed the, some of the configuration. So for folks who took a look at that, they may have looked at the first design and not the second. Well, I believe the first design that we brought to the town was back in 2013. It was a completely different configuration. It was completely different elevation schematic. It wasn't even anything close to what we brought to the board uh, well over a year ago and what is now built. It's exactly what we brought to the board, and it's exactly what's built. Correct. And, and what I was suggesting is that the folks here who are looking at South Village uh, might have been looking at the original what came forward originally rather than what ended up being approved. But as far as I can tell, and I had a chance to chat with staff today, as far as we can tell, the buildings do comport with what your plan was. Um, that's sometimes we look at architectural drawings and the architect is very uh, enthusiastic and puts in trees against the buildings that are at the mature height of the trees rather than what's what's put in originally uh, and sometimes we just miss the ball. Uh, so I appreciate the changes that you've made. Uh, I do would like to see how they fit in with the community around it just simply to understand its positioning there um, to see if it harmonizes, to see if the apartments harmonize with the architecture surrounding them. That would be very helpful to me in terms of making a decision. I need to understand that a little bit further. Do you understand that, Sean? Yeah, I think that would be children's inspection townhouses. That would be the, I think it's the trim and everything all yeah. together. Okay. Yeah. Very well. All right, thank you. 
so chairman may i comment on some of the things that were said earlier so at least the board members have a understanding of my position there so it's not just one side or is it not worth doing i would i would let the board kind of go through its deliberations okay. um typically you know in a kind of a roberts rule setting you really want audience speaking to chair applicant speaking to chair board speaking to chair um we don't want to create any type no of no i just would like to speak to the board about sure. uh some of the things that have been said because some of them are untrue that's all i yeah, I think you should be afforded that opportunity. Um, I'd, I'd ask so that you just wait until we get through our questions and we may uncover some of these items. Um, just as Rachel's pointed out that the architecture from uh, South Village was, was approved through this board already. So, okay. which let us do our thing. And then at the end, I, I do believe you should be afforded a chance to respond. Hopefully, sure. best foot forward. Thank right? you. Roger. Um, <clears throat> First, I, um, I remember when this project was initially uh, you know, planned and discussed you know, 10 plus years ago. And um, I, I think generally like all the single family homes and the townhouses look terrific, really attractive. And after our last meeting, I, um, I decided to just to look up Google on uh, federal style buildings and um, because of all the comments about the South Village. And, and by the way, I think this is a vast improvement, what you're showing us over, over South Village. But the, the dilemma you have when you're designing uh, a federal style house or a home, and then you get to a bulk size building like these apartments is that you're basically dealing with a big bulky building. Um, you, you don't have all the configurations that you do with, a, with the other style homes you have as well as the townhouses. Um, I'm kind of curious, uh, Kerry, why, why did you not, in this particular area, by the way, you could put, according to the zoning, you could put a variety of different residential buildings in there. Um, did you have a particular reason you went to apartments versus more townhouses? Eastern Village was always designed uh, concepted and meant to be an inclusive neighborhood of all housing forms meeting all housing needs at all housing prices and this is just another example of that okay um, the the uh, buildings on um, in South Village if I recall they're all white mm -hmm. are these going to be all white as well they're proposed to all be white because wouldn't white tend to make the mass, the building appear to be larger than it really is, versus because in the rest of your development you have a variety of different colors. Yeah, mostly because the how because the uh, homeowners, you know, we let them take a crack at what they want for a color, and as long as the colors are acceptable, <clears throat> they get built that way. A lot of houses I built happen to build white. White is a New England vernacular, um, and. Um, you know, <clears throat> there are, I think, some ways that uh, the massing could potentially uh, be settled down maybe by using some colors, but, um, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. Um, I just, white houses with red roofs are a uh, quintessential main vernacular, and that's what I was going to do. Okay. Um, personally, I think the appearance of colors the, the sort of like the pastel colors you have on some, you know, as you come in Valentine, you know, approaching inspiration, it looks very attractive. It Earth tones. Out, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think it looks really nice. And I, I think if you were to have a color on those apartments versus all white, it would, it would just reduce the size, the appearance of the mass a bit. But um, Do you agree with that? let me just ask a couple of questions um, regarding the dog park. I understand, you know, you want to keep it that size. Uh, do you have any other dog parks in, in the other development anywhere? No. I mean, Eastern Village is it's a walkable community. It's located right on the Eastern Trail. Um, the only real benefit of a dog park, as I'm <clears throat> told, is the fact that dogs can be off-leash. But it's not like they're, you know, on a... Um, collector, you know, the project is, is built right off of a collector road. It's the, the neighborhood's already uh, pedestrian friendly, walkable, and um, 
it's, it's a little bit of a walk, though, from, say, South Village up to North Village, especially uh, when you have a dog passing all these lawns. <laughs> well, um, from somebody who supports, uh, you know, I mean, I have dogs myself, love dogs, but, um, you know, there's a part of me that, qu that questions whether or not it's even needed. Um, again, what? we're in a walkable community along a eastern trail, which is designed to be walkable. The real benefit of it is off-leash, from what I'm told. Well, I, I mean, I think it's a nice amenity, especially if people are concerned about what dogs tend to do. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and the thing that strikes me, uh, strikes me is that when you were before us once before, you were talking about um, charging stations down at South, South Village. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, as well as um, you talked about making accommodations for package deliveries and things like that, and I mm -hmm. thought that was kind of visionary. You know, you were anticipating what the future, is, you know, holds. And I think having a dog park makes a lot of sense. I mean, people are buying very nice homes, and I'm sure, I know I wouldn't want a dog doing their thing on my property. <laughs> And um, so it might be worth just a consideration to maybe have an, another one on another parcel of land if you have some land there any, anywhere. Um, al along, another comment was about the community center. When you were here last time, I think I, think I recall you saying that the community center was primarily for the North Village. That's correct. So it's not to be shared. It's, for the rest of the, of the total Eastern Village neighborhood. We weren't proposing it as such, no. Okay. Um, so basically the reason there's no parking is because you're, you're just thinking people are just gonna walk there. That's correct. Okay. Um, the, at the last time you were before us also, the, um, the subject of that nature trail came up between Ward Street and Classical. And you said that the, um, the community didn't want it. That's, I believe that's what you said, the community didn't want it. Now, you just stated today that one, my impression, one person said they didn't want it. And I think, based on the comments about the traffic that we've heard before, to me, that, that's a very logical place to have another way of getting in and out of this neighborhood. Um, so... Just a thought there. Um, and now what, can you talk about some of the other phasing, uh, other things? I mean, you, you talked to Rachel, asked you about the Eastern Trail access. Now, you said, I think you, you answered her by saying, it, after this next building is done or this building is done, it'll be done. Can you, can you give us a time frame when, when you think that's going to be all straightened out? Um, are you talking about the entrance, or are you talking about the landscaping around South Village? Well, I'm talking primarily about the entrance, because I think that was discussed last year, re you know, redesigning that entrance. Okay, well, we didn't get approval on that. Uh, we, we have been talking about that for some time, but we didn't get approval on that until earlier this year. Okay. But we have been trying to get the contractor back over to uh, Eastern Village for months to do that work, and... We actually have a meeting tomorrow morning with the town engineer and the contractor on site to talk about getting started. Um, but um, they are extremely busy, and it's not as easy as one might think to call the site contractor up and say, yeah, come on over and do that work now. You literally have to get on the schedule. There's not enough help to do the work that's out there, and um, uh, you know we're doing our best. But that is, that is, will be taking place uh, fairly quickly now. Uh, South Village, again, we didn't want to do the work. There's still some outside work on those buildings that needs to get done. And we were trying to get that done before the landscaping was done. We certainly didn't want to start it until all the building was done. And that literally just got done last week. Okay. Um, at one of the earlier meetings also, um, when we had your full plan in front of us, I asked you about the, the um, like there was a center park. Yep which I guess is, that's Reflection Square, right? Right. When, when do you anticipate, is there, is there building all around that right now? No. Nope. Oh, there isn't? No. Nope. Okay. When do, you, when do you think that'll be developed? I don't have an exact time frame for you, but we're hoping in the near future. 
that's that's not a requirement for us to get done at this time. No, Things no. have to happen in steps. And um, I think that's kind of been lost in, in the discussion here. No, I, I understand that, but it seems to me that that's one of, the, one of the big complaints is that people are seeing things completed in piecemeal, okay? And it's, I can see where they may be frustrated because they, they expect they move in and then something's going to be, you know, completed within a reasonable amount of time and it's not getting done. Well, I don't think we've told anybody when that park was going to get done, Mr. Uh, Beeler. I mean, we are now just getting to that phase of the development where we can start to get it done. We couldn't get the entrance completed until we got approval from the town. We just got that earlier this year. Um, again, I, you know, I'd like to go through some of these things, but you know, we're being unfairly, some of these things were being unfairly portrayed. The one thing that I will say is that the maintenance down at the Eastern Road and the entrance into Eastern Village could have been better kept up. <clears throat> at the same time, you know, we would go down there and, and uh, you know, fill the potholes because it's gravel to pavement. And within two days, we'd have the same condition that we just got done taking care of. So um, we could have done a better job there. I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, but as far as some of these other uh, things getting completed, <clears throat> again, with, with the exception of one alley, and one stretch of another road, we have put on all the surface pavement that the town wants us to put on. If the town wants me to pave Federal Way and all these other uh, roads going in that they're complaining about, I would love to do that as soon as possible because the longer I wait, the more it's going to cost me. The town has asked me to hold off on that. And Angela can attest to that. Can I speak to that? Yes. <laughs> I <laughs> I just, just to be clear, we've gone back and forth with a uh, phasing plan, and I believe the last version of the phasing plan, we talked about construction routes. Um, and you're right, <coughs> Federal Way um, is part of that construction route. Um, so we actually specified certain sections of the road where you're gonna be driving over, you're gonna be beating up with heavy equipment to get into the phases further back. Um, Classical. We, we talked about that there Victorian. are some areas that could be done, like we finished up um, a lot of the surface paving, but um, there are specific, yes, specific areas that we've agreed upon. The board has seen that, that phasing plan with the construction route, and we discussed it at um, that earlier meetings. So I agree, I, I will take full blame. Um, the last thing I wanna do is accept a street with brand new pavement just to get ripped up by heavy equipment because we know the next phase is starting. So um, th that's the reasoning. But we try to limit it to that route. So uh, it's not just saying we're not gonna pave any, surface pave any of the development. It's, it's really trying to limit that exposure. Thank you, Angela. Roger. Uh, I, I guess, let me ask a question to staff. Uh, is the town satisfied with the way the phasing is going at this point, or uh, or are the unexpected delays, things not getting done? Or I mean, we hear that, but I'm just kind of curious. Um, I I don't know as I have an opinion on it. What I do is um, we calculate out what the improvements would cost, and I hold money for that. Um, there have been delays in certain sections and for a variety of reasons. So I'm not gonna point at, there's not one reason why there's probably delays out there. I think some things can be addressed, um, but we're holding money to complete those. So I don't know as I can necessarily, um, the board can have an opinion, but I don't know as I can. <laughs> Does that make sense? As some people had mentioned, you can really look at the phasing plan and see where we're at and what makes sense. Um, all I, my job is to protect the town and I have the money um, in place to complete the work that's not completed. So, so the town is protected when Kerry goes to California? <laughs> On the pieces that he's opened, I am holding performance guarantees for the, the parts that he has opened up. Okay. okay. Yes, that we could step in and complete. I don't want to. It's most of the roads, really. It's the main roads going in there. It's the main roads that everybody drives on. Yeah. 
because those are the main those are going to be the main construction routes. And again, uh, the areas where they're talking about there's no street lights, the light poles are in. The lights are hung on top of the poles. I can't go and electrify them. All I can do is call CMP, and we have. And the area and I, that, just to clarify too, I am holding all money for all those street poles. We know. If they're not energized, just because they're up doesn't mean that I'm still holding the full amount. I mm -hmm. guess I wanted to clarify that too. So um, until they get energized, I haven't released that money so that the town is covered. And, you know, it's not something where CMP gets out there the week after you call them again. We put poles up in two, August of 2017, and they didn't get electrified until, I believe, it was August or September of last year. It was over a year. That, that, was, that was nothing on us. We could not do any more. So. Um, I would the, just yeah. like to jump in and, yeah. you know, the neighbors do have concerns about the greater Eastern Village However, and those are heard, um, but the board should really focus on what's before you tonight um, for the most of the discussion. So just wanted to jump in. I mean, we did have a, you guys did look at the subdivision um, for an amendment several meetings ago, and that's really the time to discuss these specifics with phasing and, um, and greater Eastern Village concerns. But, you know, tonight the project before you is North Village, so try not to get too bogged down. Okay. Um, oh, well, I'm glad to hear that you're, you know, you're um, willing to consider some sort of buffering behind those homes. I think that would be, you know, worthwhile. So I, 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 I'll end it right there. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Rick. Taking your comment, Jamel, to heart, I'm fairly new on this board, so I don't have the history as some of my colleagues do. And I will focus just on this, uh, the plans in front. Uh, a lot of the concerns or questions that I had have been asked, such as the buffering uh, with some of the uh, abutters, uh, and you agree to uh, take a look at that. <clears throat> One question I have, and it's not shown on this plan, and I'm looking at C-3.1, there doesn't appear to have any snow storage between units two and four. And I'm just wondering if maybe that's just an oversight. It looks like there could be places that um, might have some snow storage, but the snow storage that you have listed here doesn't seem like it would be enough uh, to handle uh, the surfaces that are going to need snow removal. So. I'm just pointing that out. Um, you did show a three inch high Ballard light um, by building five. Uh, please include the cut sheet with that. And if it's also germane to some of these other buildings, I, I think you had indicated that another lighting plan or the lighting plan will be submitted with the next submission. So. Uh, when you submit the cut sheet, could you also ensure that the photometrics of that of the fixtures are on the cut sheets? And then uh, obviously a, a photometric layout of the entire grid would be would be helpful. Um, the heat pumps, the outside compressors for the heat pumps, could you just maybe explore a way to aesthetically uh, make those a little less prominent. I hear some concerns. I hear it on a lot of projects. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying put a tree there because you've got to have airflow. And certainly trees with pollen get into the fins and it creates maintenance issues. But they've come out with some fairly decorative, uh, low cost, um, for lack of a better word, of fencing uh, that are small enough that will allow air with slats through it to just kind of uh, mitigate those, um, the appearance of those. Um, other than that, I think things have been touched on that I had on my list, so I'm, I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Would Mark. you like us to address that point? Because we do have, uh, we have taken some measures to do that in North Village. I'd like to hear about it.
So on um, the north elevation here, um, also on the town road, pretty much all around the building, anywhere we do have heat pumps or condensers where you have um, privacy hedges around them. They're dual purpose in some areas where there's a patio outside the ground floor. And on the town road, they're strictly there to shield them and create a buffer to also bring down the scale of the building. So we've done that on all the five buildings around, around the area. We have, we don't have this, we have a garage or something shielding it from so I assume on the landscape plans, the finals, they'll be indicated uh, how that would look. Yes. Yeah, they'll okay. be on the landscape plan. Thanks. So. Thank you, Rick. All right. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of ground, I think, here tonight. I will say that I think the architecture you've presented this evening is, is a, a vast improvement over the first iteration of it. So we appreciate you taking the time to, you know, really take feedback from, you know, the members of the community and try to make the improvements there. Um, I think as well, uh, notes that, you know, I'm just gonna reiterate it real quick, the buffering. I think I'm glad that you're willing to take a look at that buffering. Uh, the landscaping plan, I, I agree um, that when you get down into the more detail around the buildings, perhaps there could be a little bit more, it uh, could be a little bit more robust throughout there. Um, and then, of course, just continuing to work with town, and I just encourage you to try to keep that communication line open with community, staff, and, you know, I do sympathize uh, to some extent with some of your struggles. I know what you're talking about within the industry, um, including having to rely on third-party vendors to kind of help complete projects, experience and some of that stuff. So. Um, I, I do sympathize because I know it sometimes can be your name that gets dragged through the mud even though you've put your best foot forward trying to get things accomplished. So I get that. At the same time, I think um, it's always worthwhile to just try to be upfront and you know, communicate as best you can with everyone around so they, they have a better understanding. I think um, I really appreciate um, Angela helping understand better um, maybe some of the dynamic that's going on between you know, why, why some things aren't being done right away and why some things need a delay or have to have a delay because I think we all agree taking a busted up road is not in the best interest of this town. So, um, again, I'll just encourage you to work on staff comments, um, some of the other comments from this board, and then hopefully take some, some of the comments from uh, the community here to heart, and we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. I think he's good. Um, all right, so we're on to our uh, next item. If we could just ask the uh, audience as you shuffle out to we have a little bit more left of our meeting, so we appreciate it if you could just try to be as quiet as possible as exiting. Um, number nine, staff report. Jamel. I do not have a staff report at this time. I don't, I don't know. Ten. I don't know if Angela might. No. <laughs> no, I'm good. All right. Item number ten: administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. <laughs> correspondence. <laughs> we did have a lot of correspondence uh, come in on these projects. I believe everyone was served copies through the email. Um, any other outside correspondence from planning board members? Yeah. Planning board comments. Roger. Yes, um, um, Jamal. <laughs> I forgot his name for a second. <laughs> I forget my name. <laughs> Look at you, huh? <laughs> yeah. We've been having a discussion about sidewalks, and I asked him to clarify the um, the ordinances and other whatever other guidelines, and especially where the street lady is here. Street lady. <laughs> Nickname. I've been calling her. <laughs> so what do you mean? Well, to my impression that I've, all, I've been under the impression that they're basically required for just about every neighborhood, and if they don't want to put the sidewalks in, they pay into an intermodal fund. But now I'm under the impression that the, the board does have some discretion if it's in rural areas. So could you maybe clarify that? Uh, Angela can clarify if I speak 
out of order here. But um, as I understand it, there are different standards for different roads in town, and some of the uh, roads require sidewalks, um, and some of the roads require the planning board. The planning board may require them um, during their deliberation. Is that correct? Yeah, there's um, in the street acceptance ordinance, it talks to, we have a large number of different types, more so than I've ever seen before. We, we specify down from rural residential to urban residential to, it goes on and on and on, different cross sections of the road. And so when you get into certain neighborhoods, yes, it shows, that those cross sections clearly show sidewalks and whether it's on both sides. Um, I know a lot of times this board talks about the rural section because there's some leeway and we talk about, well, maybe you only do it on one side. Or is it, or is it necessary? Or do you pay, and that's where we ended up establishing this in lieu kind of sidewalk. It's actually a multimodal fee because um, some people have, uh, developers have actually added to that fund instead of putting in a bus shelter. Or, you know, so it's all modes for bike, pad, transit. Um, so we are able to set that up with a particular developer that it didn't make sense at the time because we had future project coming along Gorham Road where the town was going to be building sidewalk. It made sense instead of them putting a sidewalk in <coughs> where we might have to move it in a couple of years to put in towards this fund, and that's where that got established. I think since then, the planning board has been open to the idea where it seems like you're kind of borderline and you, you don't know which way to go. It's, it seems to be um, a simpler answer for a lot of members to kind of toy with, okay, I can live with it, but if you pay into this, we can put the sidewalk where it's most beneficial to the community at large. Well, what can we wondering about it is actually one of um, Jamal's comments regarding the table item tonight. And I think okay. you used the word suggested sidewalk or something. In other words, you, it led me to believe that it wasn't a firm thing. It's something the board could decide whether they wanted to require it or not, you know? And I think for that type of road, um, it allows the planning board to decide whether one should be provided or not. It's a planning board decision. <clears throat> And, and if, say they decided not, you know, they didn't require it, that doesn't mean that the developer has to necessarily put money into that into modal. It's totally up to the board. But I mean, they don't, they don't have to, though, right? In other words, no. it's not one or the other. No, that's typically mm -hmm. how the, the board has had discussions and have found that it's useful um, because it does have in the ordinance that I guess you get into this gray area about required, and it's really a decision by the board to say, does it make sense in this location, and or does it make sense in for them to pay in to to an area that would be more beneficial for that sidewalk, or maybe you say it doesn't need it at all. So I mean that's strictly the board's decision in certain areas. Like I said, it's really about that street acceptance ordinance, and there's certain areas that we would require it. Um, I mean, we start talking about arterials and collector roads and all kinds of things that um, I know we had talked about in transportation too. It also matters kind of what zone you're in, if you're in the rural setting mm. or not. Really clear, huh? Sorry. Yeah. It's really your decision, question. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to guide staff. We, I need you need what? to guide staff on what you I need you sitting want. next to me is what I need. <laughs> <laughs> Any other planning board comments, Rick? Yeah, I think, and you, Roger, you brought this up. It would be helpful when we look at um, site plans for the downs, if somehow we could have a perspective of where that lot is in relationship to uh, mm -hmm. the, the site that we're seeing. So I would ask that maybe that be included so that at least visually, it would help me a lot to understand, you know, if we put curb cuts here or whatever, how it's going to affect the, the overall picture. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And just for FYI, um, obviously the Downs is moving very quickly, mm -hmm. and I'm sure most of you have poked through to see what <laughs> phase one looks like, because no. mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people have. 
Um, that it's been a lot of work really quickly. And so just, you know, um, staff has been very much involved with every step and I anticipate phase two being similar. And at this point, I actually meet weekly with the construction team out there, um, which I think has been helpful to kind of move that along too. So um, it doesn't just end right here at the planning board. Is, it, okay. is the construction team um, Rocky's team or is it contracted uh, they, out there? Both. So the phase one had actually three contractors, and okay. so the coordination um, was quite complex. So uh, okay. took a lot of coordination. <laughs> and phase two, I believe, um, well, they're always involved. I think Respera, but also um, Shaw Brothers is out there working. Okay. Yeah, I guess to that end, an update to the board would be that the Downs team is out within phase two, uh, logging and grubbing, uh, preparing for. Uh, real construction and we have a pre-con meeting scheduled for next week to kick off the, the actual construction of the project. So they are, they're moving along rapidly. Will they be working rapidly. on that intersection over the winter from the Payne Road or is that going to wait until springtime because of the paving aspect of not having hot top? I don't know exactly when it'll occur. I mean, I would ask Angela about when it could, but um, I will say that that those improvements will need to be, you know, will be constructed as as site plans are being constructed as well. Well, I guess that's the point. I think they would love to do it this year, um, but they do it in stages, so you'll see a progression happening. Mm -hmm. And they're they've designed it out so they can do it in steps, like adding a lane, but it won't hinder the the larger improvements. You know what I mean? They they're doing it in a way in steps. Um, so as Jamel said, as certain sites come in, it'll trigger that, and then they'll get to a point where they can't do anything without improving those, um, the offsite. So they want to keep that moving because they don't want to have to hinder what they're doing on the site from DOT's point of view sure. in the traffic that's happening out there. Hmm. So I would expect a lot of movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in key, uh, along with uh, the, these comments about the uh, the downs, there are two ad hoc committees that are being formed to one to take a look at the um, proposed community center the edge and the other one to take a look at the development of the town center um, i believe they there's an anticipation that the deliberations of those committees and their recommendations will be done sometime by january uh, the council went back and forth as to what time it would be done. But I would suggest that it would be very helpful for us to meet with those committees once they have their deliberations done and talk to us about what they thought, what they had in mind um, for the town center and, and for the community center so that when something comes before us, we've got a decent sense of what the community is looking for. It's like a workshop setting, is that what you're yeah. thinking? Yeah, That's workshop. Yep. Yes, Roger. Um, I, don't, I don't think we should adjourn too early, so. Yeah. <laughs> you guys filibustering me? Is this what I'm... <laughs> you, you still don't have a life, huh? <laughs> no, but I was just wondering if, uh, if there's any, Jamal has any updates on anything that's been going on in town or delayed or anything decided against or, you know, what has been happening? Okay. Um, well, the reason, it seems like, like this meeting and the last one, there's been a, a discernible reduction in the number of uh, agenda items. Mm -hmm. So things appear to be slowing down a bit? Uh, hard to tell. Um, I think there could be 10 the next time. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was definitely a quieter period. Definitely some pretty dense reviews. Um, Clearly, since we're here till 10. Um, but I will say that one project that will be starting soon is, I don't know if you recall, the Bessie Commons 2 yep. uh, affordable senior housing project. And we're going to have a pre-construction meeting for that uh, several days after your next meeting. So that'll be, that's a project that'll be starting up uh, this fall as well. The hospice is going. They're moving quite pretty fast. They are. Yeah. yeah. A lot going on. And yeah, we have a lot of subdivisions that are in full swing. It's very busy. Yeah. So it's kind of nice to have a little 
Yeah, don't complain. Don't right there, Roger. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to wrap up planning board comments with my own. I feel left out. Everyone else is talking. Uh, I'm just kidding. I just want to say, uh, Rachel, I thought um, you diving in at the end with a very hard, difficult subject, your line of questioning was excellent. Appreciate you spearheading that effort. Um, and then, Roger and Rick, you guys, again, you guys brought up a lot of good points um, right throughout. Some of, when you get to these difficult projects, it, you know, we have a good team. Jamel, kudos for keeping us on track. And Angela, thanks for taking a couple of, a couple of bullets for us up here. <laughs> so, uh, that said, I am going to motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Show that unanimous. Thank you very much. Doreen, excellent job.